I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace family, I am so happy to be with you guys tonight. Um, you know, I know it's going to be good when you guys are in the chat early. Like, that's what's up. That's what's up. I see Dr. Oya Maat is in the house. What's up, Dr. Maat? Um, everyone, Rasha Mella, uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was on early. She's like, look, I'm going to be early. Her and Kepra. Thank you. Um, Riri. All right. I see you guys up in here. So um, I'm going to give you guys a little, you know, time to come in and, you know, before I bring on our, our guests, I've been so excited about this because I've talked to them, you know, over the, the past, um, well, yeah, cause I, I've relatively met both of them like maybe for about a year now, a year or some change, but I've talked to them individually about Booker T Washington. And so when now it's like, this is going to be a mind blowing conversation because they're both here and the passion that they have for this brother. And it is so important, um, you know, when we were thinking about, you know, this idea of black excellence, it's like you can't think about black excellence and not think about Booker T. Washington. Um, I want to say a shout out to all my young people who are in the audience. Um, you know, I made sure I, I did an outreach today because I was like, the young people need to be in the house so that they get the information right now. OK, even though, you know, a lot of them are New York based and in New York, you know, all the kids have to take the regions and the regions, you know, they, they, they take global history and, you know, the global history that they, they have to just learn and just be able to, to, you know, remember these, the facts and just take the test and pass it so they can get out of high school. But we know what those facts are. They ain't real facts. And so I, I was like, I need for them to hear from fellow black people about this brother right here, Booker T. Washington. So this is going to be um, a huge show tonight. I want to just, you know, just say thank everyone for being um, up in the house. Yes, yes, yes. Um, all right, uh, family. Um, if you could, you know, in the chat, just, you know, put down where you could, where you at. I was about to say where you calling from, but just put down where you are, um, you know, looking at us um, at today. And I want to give a special shout out to Pamela Torre, um, which, which I'm going to tell you a story about her so that you guys know what to do next, because um, Pamela had, she reached out to us, I don't know, maybe a couple weeks ago, and she was looking for a VIP ticket for the event, the Hoppy Black Excellence event. And at the time, you know, they were all sold out. And she's like, were well, you guys going to have new, you know, new, um, you know, like have some more VIP tickets released. And, you know, at this point, we didn't think, you know, that that was going to happen. And so I, um, you know, we were able to release a few, and I'm going to tell you guys right now, if you are even thinking about coming to the event, Black Enterprise, I'm going to um, show you our, because, uh, you know, we get these these special um, memes made every, every week just for this event. Um, if you guys are even thinking about coming and you want a VIP ticket, please make sure that you, um, you go to happyfilm.com and, um, and uh, you know, get your ticket. I'm sorry, family. Let me just put it up here while I'm talking about this. Um, you know, that you get your ticket right now because we have a few VIP tickets left. It's a few. So if you're going to, if you were thinking about doing it, get your tickets tonight. That's happyfilm.com. And let's just talk a little bit about this event, because this is why we're here tonight with these two. Um, oh God, these two scholars are so dope. Um, one of the scholars that we have tonight, Dr. Kenneth Harris, he is going to be our host. Now, for anyone that came through it, I see a lot of you guys that was at the um, One Africa event conference, Power and Unity in Detroit in April, you know, you already got a taste of Dr. Harris. He's no joke when it comes to hosting. And I, ta I was talking to him last night about this, you know, and he was just like, you know, we, because we were really rushed with a lot of things. And so I, I, for some reason, I thought that, that, you know, we like prepared him, but everything he was doing was sort of like off the cuff and his off the cuff was so good. 
Okay, so I cannot wait for this brother to host our event um, in Queens, February 4th um, at JPAC. And if you cannot be in person, it's okay. You can get your live stream ticket. And, uh, you know, we will be um, showing this worldwide. You have a couple of days to look at it. We will not be actually recording this one in terms of like the Power and Unity Conference. You can go and you can purchase that. Um, and see all 13 hours. We're not doing it with this one this time. So family, if you're going to, you know, watch this, make sure you are watching it. You have a couple of days to finish watching it. If you don't, you know, if you got to do something, it's going to be eight hours and we will be filming everything. So you're not going to miss anything if you're on the live stream. But if you're in the New York City area and if you're from, you know, because Dr. Harris is from the, from the D, right? So if you're from Detroit, and I know a lot of Detroiters that are coming through. Wherever you can, you know, if you are close enough to get to in to NYC on February 4th, the beginning of Black History Month, all that good stuff, you want to be, you want to be in the house. It's going to be a fabulous day of excellence. We have um, Riza Islam, Dr. Susan Tata, Professor James Small, Infudishi Juhutimis, Dr. Georgina Falu, and Kaba Kabane. Now, if I, you know, Dr. Falou, she is very, um, she's very serious about her business. And I remember when she came in and she, you know, she was giving her talk and she said, listen, if you want to incorporate your business, here's my phone number. She gave her phone number out to everyone that was there on air, on the live stream. And she was like, I will do it for free. And at that point she was having groups of people and she was, she had her paperwork together. Like it was awesome. So Dr. Falou was going to be in the house. Um, and, you know, and, doc, and uh, we love Kaba, Kaba Common Name. And also, we're going to have Lyrical Faith. She is our poet. I can't wait to hear her. If you, you know, go onto um, her YouTube, not her YouTube page, I'm sorry, her IG, you can see what she, you know, what this sister's about. She's dope, too. And we have Brand Nubian performing. Okay, so I'm maybe a little little bit of an old head, but whatever. Listen, you young people need to listen to Brand Nubian, too. They're going to be in the house. And we have Jamar Milton. Also, if that was like, you know, like right there is enough, but no, 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 we are going to have, um, we're going to show these, ex like these special extended clips of, um, Hoppy and of Amadeus Christ film out of darkness, heavy as a crown volume one. And he's going to be in the house as well. So he's going to be there. Um, and then, uh, we're going to show, you know, Hoppy, the role of economics in the development of civilization. We're going to show an extended clip. And uh, it's, it's going to be a really nice event. And, it's, you know, we're talking about Black excellence, but it's not just about us, you know, appreciating the Black excellence that will be in the house, but it's really about us appreciating the Black excellence within ourselves because it is, we can't really move forward um, as a race until we have um, people who feel good about themselves, who know where they, they come from. And that's what, you know, what's, what's going to really push our, our race forward. So it's really important, you know, that we, you know, we give, you know, homage to everyone coming through, but really to start looking at ourselves and share our black excellence. You know, Dr. Oba Tashaka, uh, when he came on, he talked about our creativity as a people, you know, that that's our biggest, um, our strength. And it comes from, from black excellence, but we have to realize it for ourselves and in ourselves. So this event is going to be straight fire. Okay. Um, and uh, right before I bring on the guests, it's my last thing. Family, I just want to just first give everyone a shout out who had, um, who had sent us an ad and was in our, our uh, Happy One Africa Power and Unity Conference book. Okay. And family, thank you for just being patient with everything that was happening. And we, you know, if you look at the um, the video that we had uh, at the beginning of the year with Infudishi, Juhuti Miss, we went into detail in terms of what happened um, with us, you know, trying to uh, to get to Kemet in February. So with that, with the conference, we, you know, we finally, you know, was able to find a printer who would be able to print us the book up. So you guys will be getting this in the mail. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, and family, if you want to get a PDF copy, um, just go to our website, happyfilm.com. This is nice because you see everybody, uh, everyone's ad. This is it's a really, it's a really nice keepsake um, to have. Um, and, it, it's, and it's interesting because in the uh, at the event, 
you know, you would like get up and you would like walk around and people were like swiping them off the table. We had to like, I mean, off people's chairs, we had to tell people that, you know, stop doing that. <laughs> so it's going to be nice. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to get one for yourself, go to happyfilm.com. All right, family, just, uh, just some little, you know, things that everybody should know. Number one, please make sure that you are liking and sharing this video. Family, we are 100 people away from reaching 30 thousand subscribers on um on youtube so like i was talking to uh, a uh, a woman who actually traveled with us miss carolyn tyler today and you know she's traveled with us to um to egypt twice <laughs> okay she she goes to everything everything we do miss tyler is there but she she just told me she was like you know i i wasn't subscribed so she made sure she subscribed so i know that you guys probably watch us um you know um but we need for you to actually hit the subscribe button. Okay. Hit the little subscribe button and hit the notifications button. So every time we go live, you guys are right there and you get to, you know, get front row seat to everyone. Um, also, if you are on a super chat, feel free to use the super chat. If you are watching us on, fa on, on Facebook, you can, you know, buy stars, which is super cool. Or you could just do it the old, well, I don't even know if this is the old fashioned way anymore, but you can go to cash app and hit us up on the dollar sign, happy film. So, and any money that you guys give us, it goes straight, things like this, it goes straight back into um, our organization. So, that's it. Make sure you guys are liking and sharing this video, um, which is super important. And so without further ado, we're going to bring in our, our illustrious, um, it's not even a panel. It's just two beautiful people talking about another beautiful person. All right. So here's Dr. Ken Harris <laughs> and Dr. Dr. Tyreen Wright. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> Let me tell you, I am so happy you guys are here. Because you know, I've been talking, my kids, my kids always make fun of me anyway, because, you know, they're, you know, anytime they, I want to, you know, they want to do something, they're like, well, it's happy, you know, it's always happy this, happy that, but I'm like, listen, tonight I better see you little jive turkeys, um, you know, on here, because this is something that's very, very important that we need to, uh, you know, talk about. Um, so, before we even get started, I just want you guys to just tell the family just who you are. Okay. And um, we will, we'll, we'll start with Dr. Wright. Okay. Um, if you can just tell us just like who you are and how you just, you know, like what made you start studying Booker T. Washington? Oh, okay. <laughs> I know. Wait, did I just kind of throw that in? <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Tyreen, right. Uh, so it's kind of interesting because I, how do I start studying Booker T. Washington. And yes, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in the end. I started studying Booker T. Washington specifically in and in, in his role in Africa, um, maybe about somewhere around maybe 15 to six, no, maybe, yeah, about 16, 17 years ago, maybe. Uh, and 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 I am a Tuskegee alumni, okay. which did uh, you know? I always mentioned that gave me some insight, but it did not inspire my study of Washington's role on an international level. Uh, what did was actually reading an article written by Manny Marable, Booker T. Washington, African Nationalism, and that's when I said, "Oh no, like I can't just leave this hanging." So that's yeah. what inspired it. And, and I was a history major at Tuskegee. And so I actually sort of returned to my roots and, and, you know, dig up a lot of things. But I had great support, too. I have to say that because I had a professor there at the time who was 91 years old. By the time I'm writing my dissertation on the same subject. And he was able to give me a lot of information that allowed me to go digging in all the right places, right? So, so I will say all that to say that, yes. Um, so I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, I went to Tuskegee University, always knew I would go to a historically black college, uh, of course, <laughs> right? But instead of going to like FAMU or Bethune-Cookman in Florida, where my mom is from, I decided to go to Tuskegee because I was always a historian. 
and I knew that a historical place like Tuskegee was the place for me. One of my better choices in life <laughs> of all the institutions I've uh, earned degrees at, you probably will only hear me mention Tuskegee. That being, <laughs> that being said, um, I teach for the City University of New York. Uh, and I also, I want to plug this tonight because I never tell people about this. I work in the tech space for a very important organization called I Love Black People. And uh, what we do is use technology to address racism and xenophobia. And the organization is about 60,000 large at this point. It's an international organization. I do the ideological development course where I teach Pan-African history and organizing to the ambassadors who gather all the information that's programmed into the app. So I want people to know awesome. all about it because I never talk about what else I do besides teach. So there's an app called I Love Black People and it, it identifies safe and friendly places for black people. And just recently, part of what I want to say is that just recently, out of the 60,000 ambassadors who gather all of this information about safe and friendly places for Black people globally, because if you go to ilovelackpeople.com, you'll see a big map and mm -hmm. it's all over the world. It's not limited to the United States. What, um, what I want to know is that this cycle of the course, the Pan-African History and Organizing course that I started teaching uh, in let's say April of 2020, I just educated, uh, put it this way, I have educated 22,000 wow. people. And so 22,000 ambassadors have come through our Pan-African History and Organizing course. Wow. Okay. Uh, so every Saturday I teach for them. And of course I do other work and have done other work with the organization. And so it's large, right? But one of the goals is to eradicate racism and xenophobia in the world so that this can be a safer place for us. So um, I'd never talk about it, uh, but I wanted to talk about it today because like we have huge numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have huge numbers all over the continent. I mean, any given... So most of our ambassadors are on the continent, but of course, all over the world as well in Europe in you know, Central and South America, of course, the United States, but the bulk on the continent of Africa. And uh, that's significant. And, you know, that's a whole nother conversation, but that's significant. So aside from that, I also I do a little publishing on the side and all that good stuff, um, working with the Journal of Pan-African Studies. If you're trying to give a 2.02 after um, the transition of the founder, amongst other things. And so, yeah, I think that's it, all I want to say. <laughs> well, that's a lot. And author of Booker T. Washington in Africa. Oh, yeah, right. The making of a Pan-African. <laughs> Yo, let me tell you, you know, it's just, yeah, it, this is a, amazing, you know, when you start talking to people and you just look at time because everyone has the same 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And so you start talking to different people. It's like, wow, you did all that in your 24 hours? You know, like you, so you are really working it. Okay. That's what's, yeah. that's what's, I got to get on, I got to get the app. Yes, you do. You have to download yeah. the download yeah. app. I love black people. Yeah. I don't know how I didn't know about this app. I have a shirt. Well, I, you know, the founder and I have talked and I need to do a better job because I'm somebody who will say, so tell me about yourself. And I'll just, I, I probably won't tell you much about myself. <laughs> like, everybody needs a hype man. Everyone needs a little hype man. That just kind yeah, of I'm not a, I'm not a good yeah. self promoter, like at all. I just, what well, I'll do. I'm a doer. So I don't really like. I really don't have any much to say about it. <laughs> well, no, we'll just make sure we ain't some places together because I'll be like, look, and she do blah blah blah, and she does blah blah blah. <laughs> but thank you. I'm I'm so I, this is it's gonna thank be you. Night. Thank you. All right, Dr. Ken Harris, host of the Happy Black Excellent event, February fourth. What's good? My birthday, by the way. Oh yeah, ha happy pre birthday. While I get a chance, you know, to follow amazing feminine energy. I think that's how you should enter any discussion, uh, any community, 
uh, and have the sisters kind of set the pace. So uh, thank you uh, uh, to the Happy Clan, uh, the founder, Taki Grant, uh, our what I call her queen mother, Felicia. Uh, thank you for inviting me on this show. It's both an honor and a pleasure. I uh, just got a chance to hear from the extraordinary Dr. Tyrene Wright. Uh, for those who didn't hear her title of her book, she is the author of the Booker T. Washington, The Making of a Pan-Africanist. So this is, in my opinion, is probably one of the greatest intellectual contributions in the past century uh, in terms of her significance and timing uh, of this historic book. So uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with you. And I also got to recognize, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Queen Mother Felicia, um, our scholars and elders, Professor James Small, who was in the house in Detroit, uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, uh, sending him uh, uh, positive energy uh, up in New York, uh, the catalyst behind this happy movement, which I can tell you, uh, Felicia, everywhere that I go in the country, people are talking about the happy power in unity conference that took place. Uh, uh, it, you all set the bar and I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it like that. Those who are watching this show, you didn't attend a happy power and unity conference last year in Detroit. You miss black excellence. You miss black culture, black intellectualism, black healing, black consciousness, all in one night, mm. all in one day. Yeah, it was uh, love and black sage. <laughs> I'm telling you, every time I walked into, into that hotel, you just smelled black love and sage it was such it was just it was such a just a nice God, it was like it was a nice event it was like we were all family you know Absolutely. just yeah it's nice so Very so nice. again it was an honor to host uh you know they called me up it's like ken can you do this i said hey let me fly in from dc to my hometown detroit greet the crowd what up though uh so it was in the building <laughs> Uh, and, and it was just absolutely amazing, but just a little bit about me. I'll just be real brief because I would really love to, to engage in this, this dialogue about a historic individual that I think we should all be aware of, uh, his significance to mankind. But I was born and raised in Detroit. Uh, I could bounce a ball pretty well. I earned a, uh, full basketball scholarship to Clark Atlanta university at HBCU. Uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, we used to play Tuskegee uh, uh, right down the road. Uh, I did my bachelor's and master's at CAU uh, and my specialist degree at Wayne State University. And I completed my PhD at Michigan State University in African-American and African studies uh, with an interdisciplinary study in economics and entrepreneurship uh, from the Eli Broad School of Business. So. Uh, very entwined into uh, both the intellectual side and the practitioner side, right. obviously, uh, in my current role. And in two, 2017, on Juneteenth, um, I was hired as the 16th national president of the first and oldest trade association for Black businesses in the country and the precursor for all Black organizations in which we were founded 12 years before the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, in which Booker T. Washington was the model for the mainstream white chamber. Uh, but the organization uh, uh, is, is still around today. It is now known uh, as the National Business League, founded by the iconic and legendary Booker T. Washington uh, mm -hmm. in 1900. Uh, we now have over 120,000 members nationwide. Uh, local business leagues in all 50 states and internationally. We're opening our new Cape Town, South Africa office in August of 2023. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, we have over 125 Fortune 500 corporate partners. Uh, Felicia, you had a chance to witness a lot of the different things we're doing, uh, especially as we pivot out of COVID. Uh, we gave access to over $20 million in grants uh, to help Black businesses pivot out of the pandemic. Uh, and actually, we're going to be announcing a new round of grants uh, with American wow. Express through our coalition to back Black business in March of 2023. So, so stay tuned. Uh, and I look forward to being a part of this panel and this illustrious uh, uh, team effort to educate 
uh, the, the general public about uh, our founder, Booker T. Washington. Absolutely. So, you know, what? one thing you, you said, and I, I just want you to just uh, clarify this for people, what is a trade association? So if you go to the IRS website, um, um, there is actually for the, the nonprofit designation of trade association, it says business leagues. Uh, so the actual original connotation uh, before chambers of commerce came in existence, they were called trade associations and business leagues. So when you look up under uh, the federal government and you go for your IRS tax exemption status, whether that's 501c6, uh, um, which is designated as a business league, a trade association, or a chamber of commerce or organized business club or entity uh, recognized by the federal government. So. Uh, that's where that designation comes from. Okay. Okay. All right. So, okay. So listen, I'm going to ask one of you guys a question, but I expect for both of you guys to answer. Okay. <laughs> you know, just add in. We're just, it's like playing ball. Throw you the ball. You just, you know, do your thing, throw it back. Um, <laughs> so I guess my first question is why, sh sh why should we know who Booker T. Washington is? Hmm. Like, why should we know him? Do you want to take that, Dr. Harris, or do you? I, I always say ladies first, but I don't mind dribbling the ball up the court for sure. Okay. Yeah, but go ahead. Go ahead. Me? Okay. Well, listen, uh, you know, so I, I, I threw it at you because, threw it to you because okay. I, I always feel like people will say that I'm biased. Uh, with, because I'm a Tuskegee alumni, but I'm really not. But you know, it could they could make a good case for it. That being said, I think I think it's been very very important to know who Booker T. Washington is because it tells you who we were at a particular time in our history. And I, I don't just think you should know who Booker T. Washington uh, is or was. Um, but I think you should also know the context of Tuskegee, you know, Tuskegee, because I do think it's unlike other institutions. It's an institution that is completely and totally born out of the community. And it is an institution that tells you about where we were after Reconstruction failed and the clock got rolled back on us. So it's just a very important, it's just sort of a production of that time, right? So just so people know, Tuskegee was founded in 1881, 81. And uh, maybe uh, in this conversation, we'll get a chance to talk about the true, the true founding of Tuskegee because mm -hmm. Washington is the first principal, but he is not exactly the founder, you know, of mm -hmm. Tuskegee. That is the people. And Lewis Adams would be the, conceptual founder of Tuskegee. So I think Booker T. Washington is so relevant because he is so symbolic of who we were at that moment in time, that very transitional phase. He's someone who's born in enslavement, survives it, and it makes it into the 20th century. I mean, just, you know, he, he is sort of iconic in terms of a reflection of what we have been able to survive and endure and and the potential of uh that we have okay he builds an institution that i think is unparalleled in its role in world history mm. okay because so much comes out of tuskegee don't get me started but anyway all right i'll leave it there so that's why we need to know he is a pivotal figure in American history, but he is a pivotal figure for the African story in America that hmm. endured enslavement, survived, and came out on the other side, right? And the things that he would go on to do are things that we can only dream of doing now, you know? Yeah. So he's this, he's the story of endurance and endurability. Yeah, and I would just, uh, let me couple um, and just come out the gate, uh, be and in, in from a business standpoint and from a, 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 a brother who understands Booker T, let me just say this by stating uh, very clearly that Booker T. Washington was one of the greatest black men to walk the planet. 
Uh, I can call it personal bias. I cannot call it personal bias because why I got receipts to back that up. Um, and, and it's not just because I'm the leader of his 123 year old organization known as the National uh, Negro Business League, but because of the legacy that still exists today. And that legacy is based on receipts. Uh, so we're talking 2022 linguistics and, and lingual uh, producing receipts. Booker T. Washington produced receipts. Oh, yeah. uh, what receipts did he uh, produce? Well, uh, Booker T. Washington built uh, an HBCU uh, known as uh, Tuskegee University today, which is the anchor for that city in the region, still around today. Mm -hmm. uh, Booker T. Washington founded the largest black business organization known to mankind in 1900, uh, which by 1915 had more than 600 chapters across the world um, and over 1 million members. And he helped to transition black people up from slavery to economic independence, empowerment and ownership, which is critical uh, during a time post slavery. And most people do not know that out of the National Negro Business League founded in 1900, uh, now known as the National Business League, would give birth to the National Black Farmers Association, the National Negro Bankers Association, uh, which is the National Bankers Association today, uh, the National Association of Negro Funeral Directors, the National Bar Association called the National Negro Bar Association, back then, the National Association of Negro Insurance Men, uh, the National Negro Retailers and Merchants, uh, and the National Association of Negro Real Estate Dealers, and a National Negro Finance Corporation, and also a National Negro Press uh, uh, Association, and several other major national organizations, which is legendary, unprecedented, and his ability to have these long-standing organizations represent our community today. And Booker T. Washington as well contributed millions of dollars in today's money to support the Pan-African struggle. You'll hear more about that from Dr. Wright, uh, civil rights, uh, to foster the creation of historic black towns and settlements uh, mm -hmm. completely owned and operated by black people, such as Grambling, Louisiana, Mound Bayou, Mississippi, uh, yes. where Emmett Till's mother was protected while she went to court to fight the case uh, um, against those who killed her son, Emmett. Um, um, Hobson City, Alabama, Eatonville, Florida, um, and uh, the famous Tuskegee, Alabama, all called Booker T's Towns. Uh, so all of these places still in existence today, but uh, founded by and ushered by Booker T. Washington. He encouraged black people to go out and establish their own communities, their own businesses, their own towns, their settlements, which was a mainstay of the organization. And most do not know that Booker T. Washington coined the term, the phrase Negro Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the Greenwich District, okay. known as Black Wall Street today. So that was Booker T. Washington that gave us Black Wall Street. That's how significant he was. But when I speak about Black excellence, which is the topic for today, um, Booker T. Washington is at the top of the list, along with Frederick Douglass, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, Sir Joyner Truth, Madam C.J. Walker, Marcus Garvey, Harriet Tubman. We stand on the shoulders of giants of that generation. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, Booker T. Washington stood on his own. So why? Again, because that man's message and his vision is more relevant today than it mm -hmm. was 123 years ago when he founded the MBL. And Booker T. Washington, again, he produced the receipts that can be seen, right. tasted, smelled, touched. Mm -hmm. Every sense, sense that you can possibly think of, the Booker T way of Black economic empowerment is what we got to get back to. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, let's call it straight for what it is. All of us so-called Black leaders of today, what receipts have you produced? And can your receipts 
go through the times and last hundreds of years. And mm -hmm. so a lot of folks couldn't hold Booker T. Washington's iced tea from Africa in terms of producing. So uh, we got a lot of uh, shoulders to stand on top of. And those are some large shoulders with Booker T. Washington. So that's my piece. Yeah. OK, so um, all right. So <laughs> This is start from the beginning. Like, how did Booker T, like, just can we talk a little bit about his upbringing and, you know, how did he become this man that would, you know, to, you know, to even dream or even be able, he did not even dream, but he had to dream at first, but to, you know, create like, um, you know, a place like Tuskegee. Like, how did, like, just what was his upbringing? Hmm. Is that you or me, Dr. Harris? Uh, okay. I love I love it. I'm just your, your rendition, uh, you know. Absolutely. I'll follow you. Okay. So one more time, the question that how, what was his upbringing? Yes. Yeah. Like how did he, yeah. The hell was so, he um, you know, so that's an interesting thing because what we do know for sure is that he's um, born in Virginia. Uh, now it's so funny because I was in the Schomburg and they, I had went into some special collection and they gave me some documentation on Booker T. Washington and they actually had a, a date there for his birthday. They said something like April 8th or something or April 5th. And then I said to the archivist, like, you know, I'm sure this is inaccurate because he had no way of knowing his actual birthday. Any, it would all be a, you know, a guess in terms of his actual birthday right um because he was enslaved he's born enslaved so when the, the time they reported wouldn't have been the time that he actually was born meaning that he would have been recorded into a log of the number of slaves or a slave being added to uh the human uh assets right at the plantation that he uh was born on so he is born enslaved he uh he knows his mother by all accounts, he doesn't know his father, so but he suspects that he is sired by some stray white male from a neighboring plantation, not that particular plantation he's born on, uh, but he never knows who the individual is. And he talks about it. He talks about his mother and this man being both victims and products of their time. So, uh, but interestingly enough, so he is sired by an unknown white male that we know, you know, in terms of, we know that about him and he knew that, okay? Um, he gives his name after freedom. He gives himself the name Washington after freedom, even though his mother's husband has also adopted the name Washington. And I don't know that he, ha he has that name because he's coming from a plantation where he was you know, it, that name was imposed on him, but we know that his stepfather's name was Washington. And he adopts the name out of necessity uh, when it's time for him to go to school. And he does go to school uh, after nine years old to some extent. Um, you know, on and on, he does manage to go to Hampton. Uh, he has relationship with Armstrong. He sleeps at the school. All right, to pay off tuition, to to you know earn to go to school there. He didn't have money. Um, his prior occupation before he goes off to school is he's working in the coal mines and and things of that nature with his stepfather at one point. Uh, so schooling was an opportunity, and he took it as such. Now I'm going to tell you there is an area that should be researched. People theorize about Washington being a protege of. Um, Armstrong, and I even see, have seen modern, uh, recent PhDs uh, dare to say that that is not true. Anybody who's delved in delved into the Booker T. Washington papers would know that that was not particularly the truth. Okay, the relationship between Armstrong and Washington is not exactly what we probably think it is in the public realm. Washington is not a replica. Washington is not sort of like a protege of Armstrong and Tuskegee is not a replica of Hampton. Mm, no. Yeah. Very clear. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's been said by people wow. who have just, uh, you know, sort of adopted a public narrative and, and, and made guesstimations about that. Washington is not Armstrong. He gets, he learns some things at Hampton that he may uh, use at Tuskegee, but they are two different institutions and entities. 
Um, Armstrong had no um, vision and mission about Africa, African people. And if you if you read this book, right, the story of the Negro rise of the race from slavery. I don't know. My lighting is kind of funny. It's the story of the Negro. You know that Washington, even as a very young man, wants to go to Africa, but he wants to go. Uh, he only knows one way one can go, and that is as a um, how a missionary. So he's not a particularly religious person, but he aspires to go to Africa. And he says, I wanted to be involved in Africa in some significant way. This is early on in his ideation. So he's not what Armstrong is. And Tuskegee is not what Hampton is. That's a yeah. big uh, misconception. Uh, so he aspires to be connected to Africa. Why? Because of his mother. He talks about it. I write about it in uh, the chapter on Pan-Africanism. He said a people that could produce his mother must have some good in them that geographers fail to discover. Mm. And his mother, yeah. as African women are, are the keepers of the values. He sees her as the embodiment of what African people are. And this is what initiates his pursuit of Africa and African people, right? And so... That, that so that's where I would say he comes from, you know. And he, if you, if you read the story of the Negro, you would know, you would find that uh, he he knows a lot about Africa and African people and the inclinations and in, in the core, what I would call the, uh, the the cultural unity, that strand that runs through African cultures that Sheikh Azizab talks about. He's familiar with that and very educated on Africa because he desired to be. So he goes through a process of self-education. Mm. All right. So um, so how does, okay, so Chen, you could just pick up, you know, <laughs> this part. So after he leaves Hampton, like how does he get to this place where he's, he's building like Tuskegee? Like how does that happen? Yeah, I, I think it's all part of Booker T's evolution, his journey. Um, you know, the one thing that, you know, I admire about his journey is uh, the things that the characteristics that he picked up from his childhood, obviously being born into slavery, uh, having the opportunity, the obstacles that it took to uh, get him uh, uh, to the college. Uh, and, and I mean, the sweat equity that this young man put in, even during his college days, he learned a very strong work ethic. Um, um, th this was a tireless worker, um, uh, someone who um, opened the door and closed the doors, uh, someone who stayed after, uh, someone who took his studies extremely serious, uh, mm -hmm. someone who um, uh, not only went to school, just like a lot of black folks, especially our black women who are the most educated class in America, uh, and throughout the globe, uh, uh, worked uh, and, and at the same time, and 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 you know, and this person did extra things to uh, broaden his overall uh, uh, collective eclectic way of living. Um, um, but I would say, at the core of it, was no exception. I think your title was perfect today. Uh, he truly engulfed black excellence. Uh, he truly uh, believed that hard work. Uh, was representative of a man and woman's uh, um, uh, journey throughout life. Uh, and that work is uh, uh, from the moment you take your first breath to the moment you take your last breath uh, uh, type of person. And uh, you can see, um, it, even through his career, uh, the tirelessness um, towards uh, even his near his death uh, in, in uh, 1915, um, I mean, this this gentleman, I, I mean, we practice self-care today. Um, I wish I could have touched a brother on the shoulder back then with some meditation and uh, uh, breath work and put some crystals and burn some sage around him uh, because uh, he had no understanding of self-care uh, right. uh, to my extent. Uh, he slept very little. Mm -hmm. uh, he traveled extensively. Uh, uh, when he had free time, he was preparing his notes. Uh, the reason why we are able to go back and research him is because of uh, his extreme journal uh, taking um, uh, yeah. abilities. 
and writings and, and documentation uh, uh, that he's left us to, to re-examine uh, him in a way that Dr. Wright has done because uh, I truly believe that the narrative that has been pushed out on Booker T. Washington is a complete distortion uh, and, and part of an agenda that has now uh, met its course. Uh, and I think we're finally at a point to to uh, bring back the Booker T. Washington mantra. So in terms of his childhood, obviously uh, uh, everything that he learned equipped him to be successful in life uh, and to continuously fine tune uh, himself to be able to achieve his goals and his objectives. And one thing about Booker T. Washington, uh, he wasn't a talker, he was a doer. Uh, he was just like Dr. Wright just said, she wasn't just a PhD, she was a PH doer. Uh, and and we, we appreciate people who are able to take concept uh, into reality. And we know, uh, you know, as I'll continuously say, black people, we have uh, extreme creativity, innovation, uh, great thoughts. Uh, we can talk uh, about anything on any subject. Uh, I think the key to us is how we manifest at a high level and bring things to a reality. And so Booker T. Washington was able to execute and deploy, uh, which separated him from a lot of leaders during his time. Um, and so uh, I'll just say in terms of uh, his trajectory, uh, he is someone to follow in terms of his pursuits of, of obviously uh, strengthening his weaknesses as well. Um, somewhere along the line, Booker T. Washington said, OK, in my weak areas, I will find people around me to fill the gap. Uh, and you will see uh, not only the people he brought to Tuskegee, not only the people that he involved in the National Negro Business League and his pursuits all across the United States and throughout the world, he was a great lieutenant at delegating and also yeah. lifting up other leaders to lead uh, in, in a way that created the Tuskegee machine, the most powerful black empowerment machine known to the United States of America outside of a couple others like Marcus Garvey and Madam C.J. Walker uh, uh, of the like. But his machine uh, was unprecedented at that time. And it stroked both uh, enthusiasm and influence and positivity. And it also uh, stroked enemies and fear uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, too. So yeah. I'll just leave that at that. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, so if we can kind of just, can you guys just talk to us about um, the Tuskegee machine? Like, what was the Tuskegee machine? Like, mm. let's start there, because, and then we can talk about the haters. <laughs> 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 because, you know, because that's really, like, when I think about how, you know, um, I remember my, oh, I, it's, he's in 10th grade now, my son, he had a, a social studies project years ago in middle school where he had to um, talk about the difference between Booker T. Washington and W.E.D. Du Bois, right? And I remember us looking at the information and even though we're reading it, I'm like, this is, you know, cause you know that the teachers will pull like certain articles and you have to get the information from these articles, right? But as you're, as I'm reading the information, I was like, this doesn't even feel like this is right. <laughs> it doesn't even seem true. So, so before we go there, can you just first talk to us about what the Tuskegee machine was? like the beginning of it and, um, you know, and really like well, what was the Tuskegee machine for those that don't know? Me or you, Dr. Harris? Yeah, yeah, you, I think your research really talks about that a lot too, Dr. Wright. So I'll follow your lead and then kind of build on top of it. If you <laughs> okay. Okay, wait, wait, before you get, get started, Dr. Wright. Mm -hmm. Family, listen, you guys have got to appreciate these two. They are the most courteous people to each other. They <laughs> just <laughs> met each other like this week. And they, they, they're just like, I just love it because they are so into Booker T. Washington. And it's just, I just, I just love this dialogue between you two. Uh, oh, we, you thank you. Yes. Thank you. So that's interesting. You know, it's funny. I probably have never Googled the Tuskegee machine, probably because it is a secret network for those who know what it was. It was a secret network. So at the time, whatever the main means of uh, discovering information at, at that time, it probably wouldn't have been on the radar, right? Because it was a secret network mm -hmm. in, the most, in, 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 in the most extreme way. 
Uh, but essentially what it was is a network of people that consciously were in uh, organized um, and an organized effort with Booker T. Washington to do different things. So for example, some people will call it power brokering, which is really a largely what they were involved in doing. Uh, Washington was positioned in American society in a way where he was sort of an advisor uh, to, well, he was an advisor to two American presidents, but he is an advisor of the black community on all things. So you have a lot of things, people coming to him for reference and referrals, right? Now, some of the individuals who are involved in that are on the Tuskegee machine, but very often there are people in other positions of power who publicly are, don't seem like they have anything to do with Washington, don't even seem like they're aligned with Booker T. Washington, even possibly critique and criticize him in the public realm, but secretly they are on a part of the Tuskegee machine. And what it is, what does it mean? What is the title for someone in the Tuskegee machine? They would be considered lieutenants. So the last case in my book on the uh, African exclusion measure, I go into great detail about some of the maneuvering the Tuskegee machine does in order to get the African exclusion measure, which is an amendment to the um 1915 larger immigration bill and it reveals in there which who people who are on the tuskegee who are part of tuskegee machine it reveals its lieutenants one of them and i was telling dr harris this last night one of them being francis grimke who if you search him you would see that they're not necessarily aligned in the public realm Yep. But behind the scenes, they are working together in this secret see, network. See, and that's what we need to do. Gremke yeah. is one of the key figures involved in uh, challenging the Congress and going up to Washington, D.C., going into the chambers of, you know, of the House and challenging individual congressmen and holding up the Congress and polling the Congress to get an understanding of who is going to vote in what manner and directly directly focusing on those individuals that they think are going to be a problem when it comes to the vote on this particular amendment to the larger immigration bill. And this is how the African exclusion measure, which would have changed the demographic in our country, here in the United States forever, the black community, in our communities, I meant to say, in this country, in our communities, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, forever, right? Because, because the measure threatened to lock out any one of the black or African race forever from 1915 on. So uh, the Tuskegee machine is in essence a secret network. And the kind of stuff that Washington would say, and listen, this is part of the reason, I don't know how other people feel about it, but this is why I love Booker T. Washington, because you don't know anybody in history who actually uh, moves like this. He says to Grimke and others, go to Washington, D.C. and pull every string possible yep. to defeat this unfair measure. In other words, he's like, do everything and anything you have to do mm. to stop this okay he's every string possible and i listen i've said this before i love booker t washington uh because he was ruthless for us yeah hmm. period we don't have too many people in our history who are ruthless mm. to us, for us hmm. we have people who are ruthless against us but for us yeah. not too many not when you really weigh and measure it so he tells Grimke that, and they do carry it out. And of course, what they do do is above board. However, they are persistent. They are relentless. Yeah. And one of the things Washington is trying to protect, aside from defeating this racist measure, is that he already has a steady stream of students coming from the continent of Africa. And he wants to protect that. 
since 1893, we know for sure that there are students coming from at least Liberia, but other African countries as well. But Tuskegee has become also in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, a hub for Black students coming from the Caribbean, Central, and South America. And this is well documented. So he knows all of that would end if this racist measure uh, passes. And so um, to describe the kind of work that the Tuskegee machine did, that is exactly it. You know, secretly, nobody's name is declared. Washington doesn't come out in the public realm and say, ah, we won, we defeated this, this is who helped. No, none of that. Um, this is like all that. under the cover of night, really, yeah. for the most yeah. part. Yeah, that's how we need to move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's no question why Booker T was nicknamed the wizard. Right. Uh, well, that was his nickname. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and because he was able to play the game for the mainstream, uh, but he was also to keep the black agenda intact. Uh, mm -hmm. And during those days, post-slavery, you had to think about how you operate uh, in this game. And it took a very masterful person uh, to get to the level that he did. I mean, you're thinking about the first person who uh, sat in the White House uh, at the dinner table with a sitting president, uh, an advisor uh, to presidents uh, subsequent. Uh, you're, you're talking about a person who, uh, if you read the books, and you all know my uh, mentor, uh, uh, Queen Mother Felicia, Dr. Claude Anderson, Anderson uh, yeah. in his book, Powernomics. Well, uh, Booker T. Washington was Powernomics post-slavery. Uh, mm -hmm. So everything in the Powernomics manual and book that Dr. Claude Anderson put into place, uh, actually Booker T institutionalized it. And, and I think this is a scenario where um, a real life example, and Booker T does not get real credit for it, uh, is he created one of the most powerful institutional machines uh, known to mankind post-slavery. Uh, the predecessor to a lot of black organizations. Uh, Dr. Wright uh, uh, writes in her book about Marcus Garvey uh, and, and um, the UNIA. Uh, and, and Marcus Garvey was coming to America to practice and study under Booker T. Washington. Uh, and so that comes out. Uh, he, was, he was the emphasis behind the global Pan-Africanist perspective. Uh, and Booker T invited him uh, right. to come to Tuskegee. There was exchange. Uh, so I won't steal any thunder from Dr. Wright um, no, okay. wrote extensively about that. But in terms of other national Black organizations, uh, Booker T. Washington was the model. And, and, and let's just cut straight to it. When you're operating in a system that is industrializing, growing into capitalism, uh, if you don't understand power, you can't play in this game. Booker, right. T, Booker T. Washington understood institutions. He understood power and he understood how to deal make and deal broker for the mm -hmm. black community with the mainstream and the white establishment. And that's what's missing today. Uh, mm -hmm. We got a lot of uh, uh, um, pontificators and, and great speech writers who are our politicians but they don't have the ability to deal make for the black community. Uh, Booker T. Washington brought home the bacon uh, mm -hmm. for the black community. He brought hey. home uh, the resources, mm -hmm. the money, the support. Uh, he was able to garner significant influence with major billionaires at that time, um, the, the Rockefellers, et cetera, um, uh, the Morgan Chases, uh, um, and we can go down a list of the contributors who supported his mission to build up the black community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, as Dr. Wright just mentioned, which is so fantastic, is he understood institutions. We got to get away in 2023 from personality driven politics and economics. And we got to get back to the Booker T. Washington model, which is institutional politics and economics to drive our agenda, a mm -hmm. real black agenda, mm -hmm. um, and, and be un, unafraid, unapologetic about it. 
Uh, there were things that will never be known in public, but if you read the papers of Booker T. Washington, uh, you knew how cutthroat this brother was uh, for black economic progress, not just here in America, but throughout the entire Pan-African diaspora. So, you know, when you talk about powernomics, Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, he was the real life version of that post-slavery. He understood what politics meant to create economic empowerment. He understood what putting in place uh, political figures and judges and representatives to represent mm -hmm. the national organization. He grew out chapters all throughout all 50 states and internationally in which he could get his message out. He also developed media uh, that was black owned and controlled. So he could <laughs> perpetuate a message. And if a message came against him, he could immediately get a message out to his people to control the narrative or even create the narrative. Yes. So when you think about Booker T. Washington, uh, in his ability coming, uh, being born into slavery, finding his own way, becoming this type of man that understood how to wield power. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. We're going to kind of get the record straight uh, on what other people labeled the Atlanta compromise. Uh, the Atlanta exposition speech was nowhere near a compromise at all. Uh, so all of the uh, folks that waited till he died in 1915 to start drumming up all of this uh, uh, misinformation and revisionist history. Uh, the Atlanta exposition speech was a nail uh, in the sand on black economic empowerment, communicated to the mainstream and communicated to global white supremacy uh, for them to support black economic development in a unique way. And we'll talk about that more, but I just wanted to kind of talk about institutions in power and Booker T. Washington understood that and implemented and deployed it extremely well. Yeah, okay, wait, wait, you, you said, God, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> so, because this is, I'm, I'm, you know, I really, I'm liking the way, cause I didn't know that he was like this cutthroat, you know, like in terms of oh, you yeah. said he was ruthless for us. Okay, we gotta have some examples. But before we go do, you know, go there, I just want to know, you know, when this was happening, what was the the late what 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 was black people saying? Like just regular people that were just going to work, black folks. Like were they just like, oh, we love you, Booker T, or was or were they just like, oh, you know, like were they trying to distance themselves from him? Like what was the relationship? Oh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh, Booker T. Washington. Uh, uh, the equivalent of a national speaker in the crowds that you see drawn by Barack Obama and other folks, uh, Booker T. Washington would draw 50,000 people uh, attending a, a rally in a city. Uh, this man was truly a, a global figure at this time, the recognized Black leader of Black America at this time. Um, and so you just got to think about um, I can think of a time in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, where they opened the first um, uh, black production mill uh, in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, over 50,000 people attended. Booker T. Washington came as the keynote speaker and he lit the place on fire um, um, towards black economic development. So when Booker T. Washington came to town, that was the hottest ticket in town. That was, he he was the the Jamie Fox. Uh, he was the the talent that we have today uh, um, uh, that you see out here. He was a like of a magnitude that no one has seen before at that time outside of Frederick Douglass right. and a few other people. So I just right. have to say that yes, of course, when you're that popular uh, and you produce positive energy, the law of opposites always suggests. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have a uh, negative energy in haters. So just expect it. Right. Yeah. Um, There's a nat natural segue. There's so many things that you're saying, Dr. Harris, that go ahead. a natural segue. Look, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Lisa. No, 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 no. Go, no, please go ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, of course he's, so he obviously had his detractors. Now what you'll hear 
in the public realm is that, you know, Booker T. Washington was chosen by white people to lead black people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, gotcha. right, I, I I don't necessarily agree with that because uh, if you go back, you will see that Washington is sort of taking steps into that rightful place on his own, out of his own volition. He's aware of that in the 1895 um, speech. OK, and so Dr. Harris and I were talking about this last <laughs> night as well, and, and I was saying like, you know, this was an obvious um, instance of propagandizing against white immigration into the United States, right? Mm -hmm. So white European groups that were immigrating to the United States at that period in time at the turn of the century. And, and Washington is saying, like, hey, we have these working relationships, but let me give some context to this, too. You have to think about the condition of the African people in this country who survived enslavement. We are the skilled laborers. Yeah. We hold all the skill sets. Okay? We can make build make a uh, a brick, make a building, all of that. We hold all of the skill sets. And other groups of people know this. Okay? Now our condition at the time of being free now puts us in competition. Right in New York, you have uh, black seamen, people who worked at the docks and ports of lower Manhattan, competing with the Irish yep. and Italian groups. This is part of the reason why you have the New York draft riots in 1863, because of there's already an influx of European immigrants coming into the docks and ports of New York, all the major ports through Ellis Island into New York. And you have an African population that had been free since 1827 in New York and are working and are in direct competition with white immigration and immigrants. Yeah. And so this dynamic is something Washington is aware of. And I would say this, a lot of people don't know that he spent an enormous amount of time in places like New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then later moved his base outside of Tuskegee, I think a little further up north, right? You'll you probably know that, Dr. Harris. But yeah. they, you know, so he's based in New York for a time to fundraise for Tuskegee, to raise money for Tuskegee. So he is while he's based, you know, while he's still the principal and father of Tuskegee, much of his work has to do with fundraising as a president or a principal does for the institution so that it can survive. Yeah. Uh, but he would have known about the influx of European immigrants into the United States. So he's very acutely aware of that. He understands how it will impact the competition around labor. Uh, and he understands who we are, once again, that we are the skilled laborers, meaning all the things we were forced to do for free, we yeah. now can do for ourselves. Absolutely. Okay. So we hold the keys to uh, industry at that moment in time mm -hmm. in history, truthfully, because while somebody may finance it, who has the knowledge both practically and theoretically to do it? And, and, and that's the African population in America at that time. So he's very acutely aware of that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to address was the Garvey thing. Now, I see a lot of people who are so into Marcus Garvey, yeah. but don't know that from which Marcus Garvey comes. There is no Marcus Garvey uh, theoretically or literally without a Booker T. Washington. And that's not my own opinion. That is Marcus Garvey's opinion. Okay. Right. Marcus Garvey writes Booker T. Washington and connects with him as the result of eight educators from the island of Jamaica no. who have returned and told him about what they saw at Tuskegee during the into the first international conference on the Negro. And I know that Professor Smalls likes to talk about this. It was 1912, the International Conference on the Negro, which was a conference where Tuskegee opened up all of his industries for the inhabitants of the African world to come and see and examine and take away 
from it in the industries the best practices okay now what did that mean that meant that tuskegee at the time had about 44 40 to 44 industries and they would open up all of these shops and there was a programmatic aversion at tuskegee for unfinished products so every shop that they put on display showed you the finished product yeah. and the stages of it so in other words if you were in shoe making you are not to just make a sole of the shoe. You need to know how to produce a finished, complete product, which is a shoe, right? If you are in wheel writing, and I run down many of the industries, not all 40 or 44, but many of the industries that I could document in the historical record and in Washington's papers that existed at Tuskegee. That's still some work that needs to be done. What were all the 44 industries? I get to somewhere around... 15 to 20, maybe, I'm able to <clears throat> identify. But that being said, all of these industries are put on display at the International Conference on the Negro. And yeah. at the end of the conference, one in the resolutions is uh, uh, the initiation of a Tuskegee-like institute in the island of Jamaica, on yeah. the island of Jamaica. These eight educators take that information back to Jamaica, share it with Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey then reaches out to Booker T. Washington, and that is uh, in 1912 as well. Yeah, so this is how he finds out about it. And he models, if you go into the Washington's personal papers, you see that Garvey, when he initiates the relationship via writing, he tells Washington about his struggles in Jamaica, who opposes him his, the most, his own okay. people, mm -hmm. and he goes on to tell him afterwards that he has started to formulate an organization that he has modeled uh, after the Tuskegee model. Yep. Okay. And, and a lot, a lot of people will say like, well, Garvey took the whole concept to the next level. I don't want to take anything away from Garvey. What Garvey did, his yep. contribution to our people is that he would create an organization that would span the world. Right. And, and and we would all for a moment in time have large numbers in this one mass black nationalist and pan-Africanist organization. However, yeah. in terms of industry, Garvey did not do anything uh, that Washington had not done. OK, let's be for real. And, and the work could remain to be done. But what I'm saying is, is this Washington had perfected all of those industries. Yep. Garvey would really only perfect the printing press through which he would organize the African world. Yeah. But he would not perfect all of the industries so, okay, that Tuskegee had perfected. He would attempt to start businesses in various industries, right? But he had not perfected all of the industries. And so they really have two different functions. Although Garvey says that Washington is his inspiration he gave him the idea of being a race leader as he had read up from slavery so he oh. inspired him of his, and he informed him of his doom that's garvey's direct words yeah. he educates him on in terms of the tuskegee model and actually gives garvey some purpose because you find marcus garvey moving around the caribbean raising money for what a school what school mm -hmm the same school that's proposed in the International Conference on the Negro Resolutions, which yep. was to erect a Tuskegee-like institute in Jamaica. That's the school he's going to Costa Rica and other places to raise money for. So he gives him purpose in many ways. And he gives him the model that is Tuskegee. Uh, and he fashions the UNIA after it. OK, and then he is the person who extends invitation to Garvey to come to Tuskegee. Garvey comes to the United States for one reason and one reason only. And that is to see the Tuskegee model. Yep. OK, and then before he closes his eyes. Washington would defeat the very piece of legislation that was designed to lock yep. Marcus Garvey in everybody in that region of the world out of the United States forever, okay? So Washington would defeat 
the African exclusion measure in January of 1915. Yeah. Garvey, he would die in November of 1915. And he would, and Garvey would come into the United States in March of 1916 and make his way to Tuskegee. Had Washington failed to defeat the African exclusion measure, Garvey coming from Jamaica, which is notable in the debate and the ferocious conversation on the floor of the House, uh, specifically Jamaicans are called out by name. Garvey could not have come into the United States. So what Washington did keeps giving even after he's gone, okay? Mm -hmm. He shifted and changed U.S. legislation, which is, you know, this is why we can call him a Pan-Africanist, right? So he doesn't have to, you know, uh, do all the other stuff that uh, we can weigh and measure. I love what you said, Dr. Harris. Yes, we can weigh and measure everything that Washington did. It's not uh, theoretical. and It's not, um, you know, uh, esoteric. But no, he said he said that we have receipts. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> he said we got receipts. Way and measure, we can qualify. Yeah, we can qualify. Yeah. So, yeah. so can you guys just um, kind of back up for a minute and a, a minute okay. and just discuss what the Tuskegee model was? Like, what? How did it? How did it begin? How you know how he just worked with this Tuskegee model? Yeah, Doc, kind of go into that. I, I can trend that towards the, the business league, but uh -huh. yeah, I, I think that fits with your research. Because I want to talk to you about more about this institutionalizing things, but yeah, yes, Dr. Wright. Yeah, I, I really want to set the record straight, too, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll follow yeah. Dr. Wright. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so, and, and thank you for asking that question, Felicia, because that's the thing. So there are some young scholars who are daring to touch this arena or this you know Washington, and and and, and I and I welcome it. That being said, I think uh, people have not adequately uh, done the research to understand what the Tuskegee model was. Okay, some have speculated that it is a colonizing model, and I'm like, where in the world would you get that from? Okay, because Tuskegee wasn't involved in colonizing anyone or anything. And didn't have that kind of might, first of all. But, but you huh? know, it, let me tell you, I remember it, in middle school with my son and reading these documents, and I'm mm -hmm. just like, wow. I was like, he was just kind of, it seemed like he was training people to be slaves. Like there was, yeah. no, you know, the way, like, I, I wish I could have um, kept those particular articles. And, you know, like they didn't have a, Ty, a Dr. Tyreen Wright article, you know, <laughs> that they were, uh, you know, coming from. They have... The kind, you know, it's like all those, all the middle school kids across the United States use the same documents to do all the research for all mm -hmm. the social studies classes, right? And so, in reading it, I was just like, wow, I was like, well, okay, you know. And so, I was like, well, I'm with W.E.D. Du Bois because I'm like, why, you know, you know, why, why would he kind of develop this? So, please explain to us. So, I'm not mad at them. Or, or you or anyone, because listen, I'm a Tuskegee alum, as you know, and we have uh, something called freshman orientation at Tuskegee. And there is no shortage of students. Uh, I, I, should, I should, you know, politic to the degree that I make my book part of the Tuskegee curriculum, because it should be. Uh, but in freshman orientation, there is no shortage of students who come through that course, which we are required to take and say that, you know, Washington was an uncle, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we're right there on the campus, okay? Just as mm -hmm. ignorant as ever. And, and unfortunately, uh, the faculty, except for people in the history department at the time when I was there, uh, were more informed right and could shed some light and like no not at all right uh they alluded to things but for the rest of the campus and people who were not history majors which the vast majority are not uh that was the ongoing thing and the person teaching freshman orientation was not informed enough to say absolutely not and uh and even challenge us on saying that or repeating the narrative right there we're at the man's school 
Yeah. And then we're saying like, oh, he was, you know, whatever. And he and and he wasn't the progressive one. And and so I I don't know why the instructor teaching that course never said to any of us, so why are you here if you think that that is the mm-hmm. legacy, right? You know, so but that being said is you can't fault them because there's a whole, you know, debacle that has happened that has sort of um, promoted that narrative and created, created it, maintained it, pushed it and established a hundred years of written history with that same narrative. OK, mm-hmm. and, and, and that is largely our fault, which is part of the reason why I say some of the same say certain things in the preface of my book and that's part of the reason why the politics behind the publishing of my book uh, is what it is because I'm fully aware I'm an academic who is challenging something that academia is largely responsible for okay in terms of establishing uh, a, a record of maligning Booker T Washington and not really doing their research, just adopting the opinions of certain people. Um, I could get more into that because that kind of relates to the Du Bois Washington piece. Uh, Some may not know this, but it does relate to that because Du Bois comes out of a whole line of scholars. Du Bois produces a line of scholars (laughs) who go on and document a very long history discrediting Booker T. Washington. So I think these students of Du Bois would actually have more of an issue with Washington than Du Bois actually had, to be quite frank with you. It is very much cultivated. And so, um, but, so I'll stop there. What I wanted to say is- No, you you were talking about, I'm sorry, about the Tuskegee model. Right, that's why I want to get back to the Tuskegee model. I give you as much, as much, uh, detail as I can document. So, you know, the rules with, uh, in terms of scholarship, I can't really say anything that I can't document. And That's so right. I, I document uh, quite a bit about the Tuskegee model in terms of establishing for the reader what the curriculum was and how it functioned and what was there. L- let me be clear, Tuskegee was never in an industrial or norm of industrial or vocational school. Tuskegee was always uh, the first charter, 1881, and the second charter in 1893, always a school for teachers. Yeah. Okay. To this day, that taught also the trades, but it was a school, an academic school. The Negro Normal School at Tuskegee is initially what it is called. And it, oh. even then, has a curriculum that include included pedagogy. Only teachers study pedagogy. That is not relevant to any other and any other profession, right? Mm-hmm. Pedagogy, what is it literally? The art of teaching, right? So this is there early in the curriculum. History is part of the curriculum from the outset uh, in 1881, on and on. I share with you the initial curriculum. At the, estab- at the time that the school was established in chapter three, the Tuskegee model and Africa is called. Uh, that being said, the industries, how the school is structured is that it is designed to teach the academics and then to allow those students to perfect two industries that they would be able to go on and teach. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's smart. And so everyone was trained in the academics, okay. but also trained to teach the two industries that they studied and perfected in order to teach other people. So for example, a very uh, evolved uh, example of the leadership that would come out of Tuskegee at the time would be Elizabeth Wright. Elizabeth Wright would go on to start what? A vocational school called what? Voorhees in South Carolina. And she talked about herself being the same kind of woman as the type of man that Booker T. Washington was. 
the yeah. type of man he was. She said she is the same type of woman. <laughs> and she is a institution builder. And she does initiate a institution that educates people in the trades and vocation. But so that's very different than her going on to be a carpenter or her going on to, she is going to produce people who will master those industries. Very, very different. Okay. <laughs> so she, he produces an institution builder who will teach many people how to establish themselves in the industries. Very different from what people are thinking Tuskegee is, right? But look at very different. Yes. Yeah, so, so the Tuskegee model is basically built around this simple concept of independence through industry. Independence through industry. Right. Independence through industry. And so, that is, in essence, the Booker T model. Yeah, absolutely. So anything that you are consuming, you need to be thinking about owning and operating and establishing that industry for yourself. The idea of the Tuskegee model is to produce what you consume. Even when I was a student at Tuskegee, we used to make jokes about how the milk in the cafeteria came from the milk bank on campus because yeah. there are two farms on the campus. So um, this idea, now I don't even know where this phrase comes from, but I have it in my book and I heard it when I was at Tuskegee. There is a little phrase and I don't even know. I have to chuck this up to like, you know, Tuskegee legend. But there's a saying, leave your underwear at home. We make our own at Tuskegee. Because the idea was that whatever was a human necessity for man, woman, and child, we produced it ourselves right there. Okay? And so Washington had cornered the market in understanding what the problem was, not only for us domestically in the United States, but for what would be the problem of every African nation, which is producing raw goods and uh, sending them out, letting somebody buy them from you, degrade the price, they take it, put it in a box or a can and send it back to you for you to consume. When he deals with Liberia, he says to them, every time you open up a can in Liberia, you seal the fate of Liberians in poverty. Mm. In other words, do not consume European goods. Yeah. Do not eat out of a can the very things you are growing below your feet absolutely not you are mm -hmm. empowering another group of people and if you if anybody understands our present condition not in particularly in the united states but in the world yeah is the fact that we produce all the world's resources are in our possession below our feet all around us but yeah. other people own the industries yep yeah. Okay, and so we become consumers of things that are inherently really belong to us, the places we are indigenous to. You understand? So <laughs> let me give you just a real quick thing. This gentleman uh, who was a journalist noted what Tuskegee was. And he says um, he's a journalist from the Chicago Record. Harold in, in Chicago. And he wrote about it in an article uh, called uh, Working Out the Race Problem. And he says, a school, Tuskegee is not a school in the ordinary sense of the word. It's a city in itself, a community that dominates a whole county. It's a great industrial plant with 40 trades and industries that consumes all its own products, that erects its own buildings, first making its own bricks, that grows its own food, makes its own clothes, writes and prints its own textbooks, all by way of education. That's right. So in other words, it, the idea was to produce a sustainable model. Now, this is where the detractors will come in at. They'll say, well, they took white money. But then, yes, they did take white money because no one denies that there has to be an injection of resources, money. Then you see, if one was to read my book, you would see how that happens. What happens to the money? The money goes around and around and around because the students who are erecting the buildings and making the bricks to erect the buildings are being paid for their labor. They in turn, so the, the institution itself 
has a sustainable model with or without the injection of cash. This is something a lot of people don't know. Tuskegee students from the inception of the institution or Tuskegee itself always had a work program. Students would come to Tuskegee and work full time the first year that they are there and go to school part time. The remaining four years, they would work part time for the institution and go to school full time. That means that Tuskegee had a constant labor force that could weather economic hardship uh, that had nothing to do with anything else. In other words, they had a consistent labor force. And so, yes, there would be, they were not engaging in slavery, obviously. So the students who work for the institution were indeed paid. And then there was also a few years later after that, added on to the institution, a night school, which was separate from those who went to day school. And so all of these individuals who worked uh, at the institution at some point or another. I know uh, when I graduated from Tuskegee, I can recall an alumni who graduated, oh, I don't even know when, but I would say somewhere in the 50s. And she recalled the fact that she was on the work program and that most Tuskegee students were on the work pro program for decades after she left. Okay, so this is before folks know about financial aid, all the, before any of that exists. <laughs> Tuskegee this has a sustainable model. And I describe it for you in terms of how that works, what the curriculum was for first, second, third, and fourth year students, uh, how they managed working for the institution. I describe all of that in chapter three, uh, the Tuskegee model in Africa. And so to answer the question quite simply, the idea of Tuskegee is that it's a sustainable model, that they are producing what they consume. Uh, and the idea is that the energy goes around and around and around. And so how many times the question should be asked, how many times the money that comes to Tuskegee go around and around and around because they don't have any need to take it outside of that community. So that would be interesting. During that period, they cite somewhere around 26 times, right? Meaning that the money goes. Around. So I would like to, you know, that would be an interesting study to see how much it went around in the community uh, at Tuskegee specifically, right? Yeah. So, uh, and the, the, the method, the Tuskegee model method could be answered quite simply. It is independence through industry. That is the concept. And when translated to the continent of Africa, that is a quite uh, profound concept because African people are a mass. They're not a minority. The resources are below them. So when you incorporate that, that is a boost to African nationalism. So, and okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, family, I am so sorry because people are in the, in the um, there's some brother in the um, chat. He was like, how can I get this book? And I was like, you know what? I, I literally in the beginning of this segment said, you guys write down your stuff so I can put it up. And so okay. I apologize. So, um, no problem. Yeah, there you go. That's how you can get her book. And I have, um, I'm going to show you how to join the, um, the, the National Business League in a minute. So, so uh, yes, go ahead. You want to add on? Oh, oh, I, I, I think it's a, a great credence. So when you think about you, the statement that was made, um, it championed into the National Negro Business League where uh, Booker T. Washington wanted to create captains of industry. Yes. Uh, and, and it was not just the notion of Black businesses uh, being trapped in their own communities. Uh, Booker T. Washington wanted industry leaders that would create businesses that all cultures, races, and ethnicities would patronize, uh, uh, that those Black businesses would become mainstream. Uh, and um, based on those who never really uh, read the Atlanta uh, exposition uh, speech, it was really his statement to say that uh, the undergirding of, of 
uh, uh, developing industry would lead to relationships that would be on an equal playing field. So when you had uh, economics as the core of uh, uh, your community centrality, um, um, uh, when you had economics and entrepreneurship and ownership at the core of your family, uh, at the core of your community, you therefore could broker an even equitable relationship uh, with, with any other entity or person. And so look at these conversations that we're having today. Right. Um, uh, when you think about what Dr. Wright just mentioned, uh, the circulation of the black dollar, black patronage, uh, we are a $1.8 trillion, estimated $1.8 trillion economy, um, um, uh, which uh, would give us again a ranking in terms of a national GDP as the 12th or 13th largest nation GDP in the world as a black consumer purchasing power today. But majority of that money is spent in the form of consuming as opposed to producing. So I just wanted to take the, the conduit um, uh, of offer Dr. Wright's statements to say that we have to get back to producing uh, and becoming captains of industry and not just owning a business for the sexiness of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being able to say, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a founder or a CEO of my own company, uh, but you're not building capacity, scope, or scale. Uh, you're not operating outside of your home office or your uh, community. You're operating within a one mile radius of mm -hmm. your community. Uh, and you can't get to a, uh, a, a citywide, a statewide, regional, national, or even global context as we have the ability through business now, uh, uh, through technology and the digitalization uh, of society to be able to do business on a global scale through the click of a button. Uh, and so we get a chance to modernize uh, the Booker T. Washington model which transitions, tra transcends both in education and into entrepreneurship, enterprise, and ownership. But also, I mean, let me also just kind of set the record straight. Um, you know, this is why you have to have a Dr. Wright um, uh, speak about Booker T uh, and other significant uh, researchers and scholars. Um, uh, I'm of the notion, and I just call straight to it because uh, uh, you, in this day and age, you have to be intentional, you have to be truthful, and you have to speak truth to power unapologetically in whatever space that you operate. And one, you know, don't ever allow white educators to write about or research Black leaders such as Booker T. Washington without a thorough critique, observation, or rebuttal, um, mm -hmm. especially from a qualified Black scholar. Um, I'm not to say that uh, white individuals cannot properly research or have instruments or have a qualitative or quanti quantitative analy qualified analysis of our leadership, but in a, a, a system, a global system of white supremacy, uh, we have to understand that not everyone is in our best interest and has not been in our best interest. And to understand that global white supremacy uh, and its institutions, systems, and structures have always tried to depict Black leadership in a certain way. And, I, and we all know this, that they also have their trained Black lieutenants. Uh, <laughs> That's right, they do. <laughs> and they don't even have to do most of the damage because uh, some of our academians are uh, employed and deployed to make sure that um, uh, that status quo remains in place until we challenge it um, and, and, and do the research on our own using the Tuskegee model that we start to, to look up under the tent ourselves. And, and if no Black literature hasn't been produced, uh, this is an opportunity uh, for Black scholarship to take upon these endeavors. There, there are so many significant stories like Booker T. Washington where we really need 
um, our researchers and 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 those who are have a passion for history uh, to start to lift up uh, the true stories of our leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and keep in mind, uh, in this system of white supremacy and racism, you know, his or her story um, is always prevalent in our face. I mean, e even in today's time, they're putting laws in place uh, so that we cannot correct uh, uh, the history that has been fed. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. so that revisionist history is real. Yeah. His or her story is real. Uh, mm -hmm. In some cases, outright lies and distortions are real. Whenever you see a white author, researcher, or opinion writer providing his or her story about a black leader or individual, uh, we must read with causation. We must read with pause. We must read with a critical lens or eye. We must do our own homework. And most importantly, we must think about potential hidden agendas and special interests which depict and describe our black leadership in our historical mm -hmm. standpoint. And we got to correct that. So I just want to set the record straight on that. And mm -hmm. then I mean, there, there's also uh, this attempt. Uh, you know, I believe um, uh, that there was a plot post Booker T. Washington's death in 1915 mm -hmm. uh, to move black people away from the Booker T. Washington program of mm -hmm. economic independence economic ownership, economic empowerment and liberation to move towards a more social political agenda for black people. And yes. you kind of see uh, how this narrative plays out to where we put a lot of emphasis in social status, educational status and political appointment to deliver for black people to produce those receipts that Booker mm -hmm. T. Washington has pre uh, presented. And if you all haven't read the book, uh, Death in 60 Days, yeah. uh, Who Silenced Booker T. Washington? Um, a Nurse's View, uh, which was published in uh, 2008 by Paulette Horton, uh, who described the last 60 days of Booker T. Washington's life. Uh, mm -hmm. She reviewed all the documentation, the sources, and as a professional nurse, she, she clearly uh, painted a picture based on that evidence that Booker T. Washington's premature death was actually a cleverly planned assassination mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, on his life. And so, uh, you know, that hasn't been proved, yeah. but uh, there is this narrative and even Professor Smalls, Small alludes to it at times. But mm -hmm. I won't um, uh, check out that book. I won't belabor on that, but I'm bringing credence to this whole thing of why did we move away from economic empowerment uh, to this more social illusion, political pageantry uh, scenario that has not delivered for exactly. the community? Yes. Yes. So, yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Because, okay, wait. <laughs> Okay, wait, before we go there, because I just want to just, um, because I, I want to know like what's happening, like what's, because I see a lot of questions. A lot of people in the chat have this question too about what's going on now at Tuskegee, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the same thing you're asking. It's like, okay, you know, we had this model that was working. I love this, you know, don't buy no draws because we make the draws there. Wait, what was it? <laughs> what did you say? Wait, uh, did it? Leave your underwear at home. Oh, we yes. make our own at Tuskegee. <laughs> yes. Yes, like that, that is, you know, it's interesting when you were talking about the numbers, Dr. Harris, and you said, yeah. you know, that we contribute, uh, you, you said what? what An estimated $1.8 trillion in consumer purchasing power as an American, black, a black American population. Okay. So in, in the beginning of Hoppy, the, um, the movie, the documentary, um, you know, Professor Small, he gives a number, I think he's at this point, um, I think he said it was like $1.3 trillion. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then later on in, in the movie, you see where um, the uh, uh, Dr. Ken, um, Kenneth, um, he, he runs the, the uh, first independence bank. Yeah. Kenneth uh, Kelly. Dr. Ken, uh, well, Kenneth Kelly. Yes. And he, you know, I remember interviewing him and he was talking about just like how long the, the dollar circulates. And when Dr. Wright was talking, she was like, it was just going on and on and on in terms of the circulation. But he clearly said, you know, like now, right now, our dollar circulates for six hours in our community. Right. 
that's not like what is that's not what you were doing with the round and round and round with Washington, <laughs> you know, um no. with with his um, you know, uh with what he was doing down there. We I mean, this is something I'm trying to figure out like like how did we move from that? Is it because he passed away and he wasn't able to, you know, keep the torch, you know, burning or like what what was it? Because I one of my questions I want to ask was was there at any point was he grooming someone to to take over, you know, you know, when he wasn't going to be around anymore? Was he grooming anyone? Was there anyone in the wings where he was trying to teach them the way? Well, yeah, obviously you can see through uh Tuskegee University, obviously it's had its leader. There, there's no success without succession. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I always say that and and you know, there's been political structures, even, uh, struggles even within uh, the progression of the National Negro Business League. Um, right. There's a downturn period when uh, this organization at one point, um, and, and in terms of the black community, is one of the most powerful organizations in the world, probably up until the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, uh, leadership having its, uh, you know, all organizations go through this. Uh, but it coming on to me to where now we get a chance to take the organization into the future uh, is quite promising. But um, from a Tuskegee standpoint, I was just there for our 122nd uh, convention, annual convention in Tuskegee. Uh, their new president is, is unbelievably uh, a visionary. Uh, right. they, they've made it through their board struggles and things of that nature. And Dr. Wright probably could allude more, but uh, definitely uh, succession, uh, obviously the two institutions are still in place. But are they are they operating the same way with this? You know, um, no, not okay. No, I, I, can I speak to that? Uh, just yeah, to yeah, that's you, Doctor Wright. Uh, I can speak yeah. about the business league. <laughs> okay, so I, I, um, I want to make sure I give a disclaimer about my work. My book is about the old Tuskegee, the original Tuskegee. Yeah. Okay the Tuskegee vision, mission, and uh, this model that Washington, once he perfects, seeks to share with the African world, which is that concept of independence through industry. And he give, doesn't just say do that, but he gives a model of that. That's what the International Conference yeah. of the Negro is about in 1912. Yeah. Um, so this is certainly about the Tuskegee of old. That's what I'm writing about. What exists today is a very different institution it's gone through many changes. Washington was a very, uh, a unique kind of leader. Yeah. Uh, others would try to emulate some of what he was doing and to our detriment. Yeah. I, my own personal theory about situations like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment was uh, a sort of a semblance of that president trying to do a quite a uh, dangerous dance with the U.S. government. See, Washington had perfected this, um, e you know, even right down to having these relations with uh, people like U.S. President. Um, Dr. Harris, you mentioned that he, he comes to the White House. He didn't just go to the White House and have dinner with Roosevelt. He frequented the right White House. And this yeah. is what you can see in, in the case that uh, in the case on the Liberian crisis. He brings the Liberian Commission, a group of men, the ones that are on the cover of the book and in the uh, fly of the book in the beginning. Uh, those men come to the United States and he brings them to a secret meeting at the White House where they face to face, they are face to face with the Secretary of State, Elihu Root, and with Taft, the, uh, the president elect at the time, and Roosevelt the incumbent president at the time. So and so that's the kind of power that he had. However, it was a very particular dance. He knew how to do that without us being harmed, okay? Uh, the others would try it and we would be harmed, okay? And that's what you see with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. That's what you see with some other things that go on in history none of his predecessors are anything close to him. He, right? he, understood, he understood white people. 
he understood. Yeah, he did, but he understood power too. He understood power. I would he understood probably, yeah, power absolutely. and and mm -hmm. how power moves and what to do with power, and and so that's the significant difference. Few people can dance with the U.S. government and not get hurt because <laughs> yeah. they can make a situation that looks like it's to your benefit end up being to your detriment over yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. I would never uh, suggest that that's something that anybody should do if they do not understand power dynamics over a long period of time and, mm -hmm. and how power is moving and how to utilize it. So the others will come after him and they will try it and fail. Okay, yeah. he is a very different kind of human being, and that's that's what's so extraordinary about him because he speaks to uh, just our brilliance, right? Black excellence, in the sense that this is a man who is born in chattel slavery. slavery. None of us <laughs> can yeah, understand I, just, what that is to rise to that level, right? Or to be born in that condition. In that right? condition. Yep. And then and right. be able to understand your body power. does not even belong yeah. to you, right? Then, but then how, how? That's what I'm trying to figure. Out. How did? How was he able to? You know, to uh, perfect his um, ability to understand power. Like, where did these things come from? Well, you if, know where it came from. He's black, and uh, <laughs> you know what? And listen, I, I, you know what? That's and, enough for me. And, and and he's surrounded by his ancestors, and right. he attributes his connection to his mother, his African mother. Right. Uh, he was very uh, 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 black conscious right. um, his, during his entire life. Mm. Uh, and, and he was also a spiritual man uh, as well. And, and, you know, we didn't get a chance to really jump into it, but, you know, our job is not to be Booker T. Washington. Right. Our job is to take his generational legacy and modernize it. I mean, uh, we're not going to try to rebuild the pyramids in Kemet. We're, we, <laughs> want, we don't want to bring Kemet in its in its uh, glorious form back to the Kemet that existed 5,000 years ago. We want to modernize Kemet for today. We want to take the principles, the foundation, the yeah. structure, yeah. the impetus, the, the economic, political, cultural, and educational framework that they operated from. Same thing as Booker T. Washington. So I'm so thankful for Booker T. Because now I get a chance to take the organization into the new knowledge-based digital economy. As I would say, the revolution won't be televised. It will be digitized. But I get a chance to now take the foundation that he has left, this 123-year-old infrastructure and framework, and move us into the future, right? And that's where the ancestors want us to go. This is why they left what they left, so that we could move it forward. And just to say, even in, in context, uh, Book Booker T. Washington was very clear about his position towards the social illusion and political pageantry, uh, that we witnessed then and that we even witness today. Um, Booker T. Washington believed um, wholeheartedly that Black businesses should be the core of every endeavor in the Black community. And to, uh, emphatically, he stated that we should steer away from politics uh, until we garner economic control and that economic control has been formulated. Booker T. Washington <laughs> believed that pursuing politics and social status without an economic base or producing an economic uh, base would be non-substantive to the Black community. And you can even look in 2023 today um, where his vision stretches in today's time. Uh, we are trying our educational, political, and social pursuits without any e economic equity or wherewithal or control or ownership in the community and look at where that has gotten us. And so you think about what the Democratic and Republican parties have said that they would deliver for us and has failed to deliver up to this point right. anything economically substantive for Black people since slavery. 
Um, some would say that we're worse off today than we were during the post-slavery reconstruction period after 1865 in terms of economic power, ownership, and control. And I mentioned before uh, Booker T. Washington in, in the Atlanta Exposition speech of 1865, um, and it again, not being anything about compromise. And, and we need to take that into notion because uh, they called him an Uncle Tom. We now know that Uncle Tom is actually the good guy in the narrative. So yeah. uh, uh, Sam <laughs> is actually the right. person that, that is, that is the bad person. But uh, that hidden and uh, white agenda or black bourgeois agenda is now being exposed because we have uh, researchers and intellectual scholars like Dr. Wright and other folks who are unearthing the real Booker T. Washington story, which I think is more relevant to the youth to grab on to today. Because if you raise the hand in the classroom, Queen Mother Felicia, mm -hmm. what the students will say, ask them in your next class tomorrow, how many of you either want to own your own business or work for someone else? 99% of our children are going to say, I want to own or produce my own business. And if I do work for someone else, I want to eventually learn what I learned from them and go start my own business for myself, no wow. matter what industry or trade. So if the future marketplace represents entrepreneurship, ownership, and enterprise development, I could tell you, Felicia, we need to follow the market. Uh, so it's funny how history repeats itself we are actually going back to our indigenous comedic and African roots, which is stemmed in creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, and ownership. This is how we civilized the world 5,000 years ago. A tentacle of that can now be visualized through the Booker T. Washington model. And mm -hmm. here, here is a quote um, from the Atlanta Exposition uh, speech, and, and I'll kind of read it. it. It says that um, the opportunity here afforded with will awaken among us a new era of industrial progress of the ignorant and the inexperienced. Today, you can translate that to the unemployable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a new life will begin from the top, not at the bottom. That seat in the Congress or the state legislator was more sought than a real estate or industrial skill, that political convention or stump speech had more attractions than starting and owning your own dairy farm or truck garden. Booker T. Washington urged that we choose black business ownership over political platitudes and false promises. And if we are to connect with a politician, we are to connect with them in a way that's going to drive our economic and entrepreneurial and enterprise pursuits. And so look at that context, folks. Imagine uh, that Booker T. Washington was right. Imagine where we would be as Black people in America if we followed the Tuskegee model, the Booker T. Washington model, and we actually owned our businesses, we owned our own, we controlled industry, we controlled the trades, we control professional services. Imagine where we would be as a black, a black population. What he said is, if we are able to control that, you will have politics, education, and culture of your community right. built on top of your economic situation. So you will get politics, education, and culture automatically because you got the economic equity and wherewithal in your yes. community. Yes. So Yes, Again, yes, yes, yes. Read the speech, the revisionist historians, the people talk about this created narrative of an Atlanta compromise. There was no compromise. Booker T. Washington was very emphatic in saying that either you deal with us in terms of our economic pursuits or don't deal with us at all. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Can I, can I add to that? And he's saying that not from a position of uh, being disempowered. He's saying that knowing that the people he produces and the masses of Black people who were formerly the laborers are the skilled persons. Yeah. 
who are in mass in the South in particular. Yeah. He's not saying that and we don't have any leverage. He's saying <laughs> that and he knows the leverage we have. Oh, oh, these traditional yeah. people. This is ingenious. You know, um, and first, uh, peace out to Arden Plumbing. I mean, this is a black owned business right here, Arden Plumbing, which is actually in our book. Okay. Yeah, he traveled with us to Kemet. But this is, you know, um, it, this whole idea of, um, oh, God, I love this. I, I, don't know, I, feel like I even make, my, I might make my own T-shirt tonight, Independence Through Industry. Because a lot of times, like, when I, um, I remember sitting up in class with Infudishi Juhuti Miss, and anybody that took class with, with him um, knows this. You know, so he teaches us the Mudu Nature, right? You're like, okay. So he has his own curriculum. On curriculum, we're his own space. And so, you know, you have to like practice with these, um, you know, with these cards. He makes his own cards. The book that we're reading okay. from the curriculum is his book. You know, so it's like this, like that to me is, you know, creating independence through industry. You know, like he owns every part of it. Right. You know, that is that is so I, I, I'm trying, you know, I really want to um, we got two more, just two more little areas to to. to to go into, but before we go there, I just want to talk to you, Dr. Harris, uh, for a minute about this institutionalizing, institutionalizing, um, you know, or just building institutions in our community. Why is that important and what can they give us? Building institutions allow for you to take on an African centered um, program and dynamic. Um, Eurocentric, in my personal opinion, Eurocentric models do not work for Black people. Mm -hmm. um, the individualized, um, uh, competitive to destruction mentality, uh, the uh, status-driven aspect for self-esteem um, gets away from the collective community visioning that I think produces a more longstanding institutional vigor um, that our communities, especially the black race, need to adopt because I, I we see it visually that other ethnicities and cultures already adopt this mentality uh, in terms of institution building. So black people are the only ones who embrace everyone else's institutions and culture as opposed to producing yeah. our own. So yeah. there's a, a very important narrative and, and I'm not going to uh, uh, just think about where we are. I mean, we are 150 plus years post-slavery. We are a magnificent people. Look at where we are today, where we have come from, uh, what we have produced, uh, I even say where there's a level playing field and you put us up one-on-one, -on -one, mano e mano against anyone, a, a black woman, a black man, uh, it's not only are we going to get in the game to win, we're going to change the game to where you have to uh, catch up. So I think there's a, a reason for real exclusionary uh, scenarios to the, to, to the mainstream of society. And, and keep in mind, um, we were most successful per post integration from an economic standpoint. Um, uh, integration socially, educationally, um, um, and, and things of that nature, uh, the ability to have freedom and liberation is fine, but economically, uh, we have to learn uh, to support our own uh, in, from a vantage point of almost being intentional uh, as supporting and patronizing Black first our institutions um we need to think black first in where we spend our dollar uh, we need to think black first uh how we're educated um malcolm x uh, uh always said that why would you have someone else uh who is your oppressor educate your children yeah. uh, we need to get back to booker t washington booker t actually implemented that program uh and sent his lieutenants out to duplicate that program uh and so we are a magnificent people. So this is part of our evolution. Uh, we are where we are right now. We have nothing but opportunity in front of us. Uh, we are growing three times the national rate in entrepreneurship. Black women are the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the country, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, or gender. 
Uh, I believe they are returning back. Black women are returning back to their indigenous uh, civilization forming aspect as eclectic feminine energy that is meant to birth and to grow and to foster and create and innovate. So it's a natural condition. And I also believe uh, as a black man, when the woman is whole and strong and free, the community will therefore be able to restabilize itself and the black man will begin to rise. But I'm not going to hit everybody on that metaphysical <laughs> vibrational energy level uh, that transcends on why black people are coming back regardless. Uh, <laughs> nature is following and leading us back to ourselves. Uh, the universe is leading our, us to ourselves. Uh, we are moving back to our spirituality and reforming institutions that were excluded, destroyed, pulled away from us, uh, transitioned away from us. And you see the young people returning all the way back and going back to their natural hair, their natural skin, meditation, breath work, entrepreneurship, and people are looking around like, what is going on? They, yeah. it, you know, so what's naturally happening to us in terms of institutions, it's already coming out of our DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nature yeah. and the universe is always so don't uh it what I'm trying to project to the audience through myself is to say, have faith in yourself. We are going to win, we're going to deliver. Uh, we're going to bring the world back to stability. Do the best that you can where you are. Uh, but remember that we have great examples like Booker T. Washington, who gave us the black print for us to move together in, in, in a positive way. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you don't have a mentor at home or a coach at home, mm -hmm. open a book. Go get Dr. Wright's book, right? If you need to know about black excellence, Go read Booker T. Washington's book uh, on character, okay? Um, and and look up uh, the different dynamics. And there's so much Hold literature. Out. Again. Hold uh, up the books again. <laughs> yeah, well, this is this is the Booker T. Washington reader um, uh, that talks about up from slavery that inspired okay. Marcus Garvey, the larger education, character building, and the Negro problem. But black excellence is all in this character building book. Uh, which is 37 lessons and speeches that he taught every Sunday night to black students, faculty, and visitors at Tuskegee University. Um, and, and I can tell you, he's talking about black excellence in a way that, that you can read it today and understand that this guy was about integrity. He was about the upright man and woman. Uh, he was about yeah. Uh, I, I, and Dr. Wright's over there. She, I'm dropping <laughs> the ski nuggets for you real quick. But uh, this is our time. And, and um, uh, we have the commercial ability. Uh, we have the resources. If we open our minds to a global economy, Africa is waiting on us. The Caribbean, the islands, anywhere Black folks are indigenous or were dropped off um, during uh, the transition, uh, those are places of economic opportunity for you. Um, and we have an unbelievable opportunity with the digital economy uh, to take a commodity, good product or service and to turn it into a functional generational legacy building business for you and your family. So this is a huge opportunity. I'm excited about today and tomorrow. Uh, but most importantly, when you get to see with uh, sit with Queen Mother Felicia and, and Dr. Wright. Um, I can go on and on uh, about that feminine energy that is changing the world. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank <laughs> you, yes. <laughs> um, can, can I jump in? Yes. Yep, yep. If you so, ask last question. So Dr. Harris is very correct, is correct. <laughs> uh, you know, I, so yes do get the book but so i'm i'm expanding the book there's a, i wrote a revision of the book like four years what 2018 whenever 2018 was mm -hmm. probably <laughs> but it's it's about to come out this year um this is the collector item because i this is 
going to be no more. But this is like the original raw version. And there's some things that I say in there that that are not said the same way in the next version of the book. But let me say this. What I know for a fact is that Dr. Harris is right because I saw the congressional record. And it is through the congressional record that I construct um, along with Washington's personal papers, I construct the African exclusion measure case, that case. And there is a ferocious debate that takes place on the fl floor of the House that, um, that needs to be referenced. Uh, one white politician uh, takes the floor and begins to talk about the African population and chronicles our story and says that, you know, essentially 250 years of slavery and only 50 years of freedom at this point by 1915. This, these people have an epic story. There is no other story of a people like this in the history of the world. This Period. is the white man that's saying this, okay? He... It goes on to say that these people who were in slavery for 250 years are looking us eye to eye already. Mm. And if it were any a group of people, yes, he's saying this to his white colleagues. And if it were any other group of people who had such an epic story, you would be praising them. Yep. Mm. Okay. And this, so, mm. and so, you know, sometimes when I speak as a historian, I do like to reference that because I've had students in the context of teaching history who will say to me, oh, Professor Wright, you must be angry. No, I could never be angry because I'm very aware that we have some of the most, the mightiest ancestors that have probably ever walked the earth, period. 100%. And, uh, so ha and, and they loved us in a way that uh, few people can collectively talk about being loved, meaning that, you know, they lived, they survived when their own humanity was not yeah. respected or valued, right? They still... Mm -hmm. um, they still forged ahead and 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 they were such uh they were so invested in the future which is very interesting let me take it back and make a connection to because i saw people talking about african culture in the comments dr harris touched on it yes tuskegee had african culture and not as much in bringing declaration like everything with tuskegee but more in practice this whole concept uh the book character building absolutely character building is an african principle mm. okay uh building character is an african principle and and we we see that with african leadership and we even know it in the works of people like uh thomas sankara and kwame nkrumah talk about character building now the interesting thing is tuskegee has a chapel where did the book come from character building the the book character building comes from the lectures that washington gave in the chapel every sunday every sunday it was a non-denominational space so he is not pontificating about religion some yep. people have tried to take issue with me um, when I spoke about this because I they have asked me, is he a religious person? Well, if you read my book, you will see the numerous articles he wrote about uh, opposing Christianity in Africa because he understood it was being weaponized in order to colonize our people. Mm -hmm. But what we do know for sure is that in his space, on his campus at Tuskegee in the chapel, he chose to give lectures on character building, which is a longstanding African principle. You can call it character building or you can call, talk about it in terms of raising one's ache, okay? Power, consciousness. So 
so that's right there. There is African culture uh, <laughs> taking place, right? Characters have, and, and you hear this over and over and over in our only our our culture. Beauty is as beauty does, right? Putting emphasis on the action, the behavior. That's right. Right. So this is fundamentally African. These are some of the African principles that Sheikh and Jaka is talking about, right? The cultural unity of Black Africa. These are some of the things that across time that we maintain and retain. That's okay? right. So that is distinctively African. But also, if that wasn't enough um, to the issue and question of Africa, how African it, uh, was Tuskegee, when I was doing my research, and you know, there's there's always there's a million stories involved in all of this, but mm -hmm. I am seeking to document that conference that I told you all about, the International Conference on the Negro. Yeah, we, we need to bring now, I'm I'm going back and forth with the archivist at Tuskegee, and um, he's he's uh, I would say he's new in comparison to the longstanding archivist that I and he's and he's not an African person. Let me say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, okay. I'm telling him where to go because I'm saying this is when it happened, this is who was there, and I need some documentation. Like, this is, you know, all the circumstances. He's sending me the Tuskegee student, and I'm saying, no, that's not the conference. This is the conference. Now, so it always takes somebody who actually knows the historical things to sort of even guide the archivist. Okay, and I've worked as an assistant archivist before, so I know this. Anyway, that being said, uh, one of the newspapers he sent to me that is not uh, documenting the conference, in the margins of the Tuskegee student, the newspaper, someone around that time, because it's handwritten, documented that they consciously inculcated relationships between African Americans, black students, and African students. This is consciously, this is consciously being inculcated at Tuskegee. This is what someone who was writing, <laughs> a Christian Harlan who was writing it. But the point is, is that whoever had their hands on that newspaper, which is called the Tuskegee Student was paying close attention to the conscious coalescing between mm. continental African students, yes, African students bought, um, born and raised in the Americas, mm. okay? mm. and, and, and noted that, like, they are inculcating this, right, to understand the depth of the word, right, inculcate. So they are cultivating this, these pan-African relationships, okay? Mm. Um, now, I don't share that in the book, but this is some of the, you know, common knowledge that I uh, acquire or lay, you know, knowledge I acquire as being in proximity to the subject matter. And it's very important because this is the vein in which, you know, they forge ahead to have these kind of relationships. Uh, and, and I can give you a lot of examples of that, but I'll stop there. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I, it escapes me now, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Wow. Um, so, it, it, okay, so I know because I'm just I'm blown away with all this information, this new information I've learned about Booker T. Washington. And I'm like, oh, man, we you know, I, um, like we really we have to really get back to this um, independence industry, not get back to it, but improve on it, you know, and, and just Modern, modernize it. Modernize it, yes. So now, can you just, you know, and, and this is this will be my last question. Okay. Um, I just want to know if you guys could just talk to me a little bit about this. This um, was there a real rift between him and um, W. E. D. Du Bois, or was that just hype, or were they friends, you know, behind behind the scenes, or the, like how what was going on with that relationship? <laughs> well, I, I I can say from and Dr. Wright's going to go deep into it. And, and you really, um, uh, for those who have not gotten her book. Yeah, um, somebody wants to know that um, Joelle, what was that? Y'all need to get Booker T. Washington in Africa, uh, The Making of a Pan-Africanist uh, by Dr. Wright, because she goes into deep detail that that longstanding 
uh, relationship. But again, uh, from most people don't know that uh, it was Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois who provided Booker T. Washington with the business listing for him to start the National Negro Business League. Uh, and so most people, uh, are right. That's a big shocker. Um, yeah, and, and, and that they worked extremely close together. Uh, uh, so when the real, uh, up to a certain point, um, they have a very strong relationship and, and, um, you know, it's, it's hard for scholars sometimes to get from behind the contours of their, uh, uh, academic environment and to get into the streets and implement a plan. And Dr. Du Bois, one of the greatest known uh, scholars, intellectual conscious scholars towards black liberation um, of our kind. Uh, but uh, you know, you're comparing apples and oranges when it comes mm -hmm. to the Booker T. Washington who was in the streets, uh, connected with the machine uh, uh, in every fabric of every community and able to implement, deploy, and execute. Uh, and so, again, based on the Philadelphia Negro, uh, out of that study that took place in 1899, uh, uh, Dr. Du Bois had accumulated a database of all the Black businesses in the South. So what did Booker T. Washington need uh, to start the National Business League, he needed that database. He wrote Dr. Du Bois. Dr. Du Bois graciously uh, provided the database. And on August the 23rd, 1900, in Boston, Massachusetts, the National Negro Business League was birthed uh, through the culmination of their joint efforts. Uh, and I can go through numerous uh, scenarios where Dr. Du Bois... Uh, worked closely with Booker T. Washington uh, in terms of economic pursuits, in terms of the Pan-African Congress, uh, in terms of so much that Dr. Wright writes about. And so um, uh, before we go, I I'll finish up after Dr. Wright uh, kind of speaks and, and, and delves into her expertise in that matter. Dr. Wright? <laughs> I, I, I'm taking notes. Uh, look, so I'm I'm here, but I'm also taking notes. Yeah, I'll hold <laughs> I, I'll hold I got nothing but notes up in here. And, okay. and for, um, as scholars, we always, again, um, what I try to produce is what is written uh, that you can research. Uh, right. And and for those who um, have not purchased the book. Um, uh, which uh, articulates that relationship uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, du Bois and Booker T. Washington. One, you need to get The Negro in Business uh, by Booker T. Washington, um, uh, which formulates uh, that discussion. Uh, but what goes into detail is The Necessity of Myth uh, by John H. Burroughs. Um, and he writes about the formative years of the National Negro Business League uh, in this document. And he talks explicitly about the relationship uh, between Dr. Du Bois and uh, uh, their working relationship in terms of uh, Black business development uh, and the National Business League in its formative years. And so uh, 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 you should check that out. So sorry about that, Dr. Wright. I just wanted to get some literature references uh, so that po folks know that we're not just throwing stuff pie in the sky. <laughs> right. No, no, no. That's wonderful because it gave me a chance to finish my thought in my notes. <laughs> so, okay. So one, let me say this uh, because uh, someone, I see the comments and, you know, unlike most of these uh, panels, I usually don't read the comments. Okay. Um, but tonight I've been reading the comments. I just, you know, I just deal with, because it's a lot of work to read the comments and then, you know, but tonight I'm reading the comments. That being said, um, <laughs> to get to the point about uh, Washington and what, why, why is this um, misrepresentation of Tuskegee allowed and what is it about? 
it has everything to do with, yes, disconnecting us from a model that would have worked for us. So Dr. Harris, you and I are going to have to talk about all of those independent Black communities, because most people only know about uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Greenwood section. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they have no clue that are numerous. That is a book that has to be written Absolutely. about all of the Black institutions and communities, because it certainly was not the exception. It was the rule. It was the rule. Both, um, coming through Reconstruction and right afterwards. Our yep. progress is extremely swift. And I like to theorize that we don't know it. I know it. Uh, some of us know it. But we are living in the backlash of the progress that we made the first Absolutely. 50 years out of enslavement. And, yep. and for many of and we like to talk about the civil rights movement as a high point. No, that was a low point. That was a low point. Yep. That was a complete low point uh, for the African community that had survived slavery and ripped to the point we ripped out of that institution and began progressing immediately. It scared everyone who saw it. Okay, yeah. Even those who were sympathetic to the plight of formerly enslaved no longer were sympathetic because of how we come out of enslavement in this um uh, as though we had not been uh, impacted, okay? To be wow. quite the progress is so sharp, yeah. right? And so the only response uh, white Americans have, and I, I end the book with talking about some of this, their response was just waves of violence. Yes. Okay? That was that was their response to it. I'm going to murder you. I'm not going to compete with you. I'm not going to, I'm going to murder you. That's I'm going to burn your communities right. back. I'm going to murder you, and that's it. And so... We know the last of those communities, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Greenwood section, but they are numerous. Yep. I, I, on um, I Love Black People uh, program on uh, a DC station, Howard University, I talk about this, but that is a book yet to be written about the numerous black industrial and sustainable communities that existed. The difference with Tuskegee is Tuskegee was one that masqueraded as a school. Yeah. Mm. And it still exists. Mm. Okay. It was not destroyed. And yeah. it very likely wasn't destroyed because of who Booker T. Washington was. Yeah. Okay. Um, I talk about a South African student who comes and visits Booker T. Washington and then goes back to South Africa and writes something called My Tuskegee Pilgrimage. And in it, he, he has a revelation. When he met Washington, he was not impressed. He said, the man has very little to say. He's not charming. All of that, he's preoccupied. And then when he gets back to South Africa, he realizes that, oh my goodness, this man was surrounded by nothing but white counties and that he understood, Washington understood that at any point, these Southern whites could surround Tuskegee bomb the whole industrial community and lynch him and his students yep. all in one night. And, and and the things that he was doing, no one understood that he was doing. He took great risk in doing them, just Tuskegee having Tuskegee in and of itself. But he was up to a lot. He's, he's propagandizing against the atrocities in the Congo. Okay? <laughs> he's allowing people to take asylum in Tuskegee, even though there are some famous cases where he tells people they cannot take asylum in Tuskegee and then turns around and secretly gives them asylum in Tuskegee and provides for their medical care after one of these violent attacks. He is a master at wearing the mask, which is something that we probably should study. But he does yeah. Uh, he does something that is undone, hasn't been done at that time or afterwards. He is able to facilitate this period in our history that few could. We are, their response to us is wholesale murder. He not only is able to survive, uh, he is able to produce a class of people, an industrious class of people. Yeah. who are not at the beck and call. So I'm going to, let me go to my book because I, this was controversial. So anybody's read the book knows about this quote that I'm about to 
cite from. It's the beginning. It's the open of the appropriate chapter, chapter three, called the Tuskegee model in Africa. And one of Washington's um, major critics was a very racist man by the name of Thomas Dixon. And Thomas Dixon was no ordinary person. He was the author of the book called The Klansman. And he had an ongoing vendetta with Booker T. Washington. Now that's very interesting. If people thought that Washington was liberal, then why would he have an ongoing, you know, I mean, you know, but if people thought that Washington was um, conservative, play, yeah, yeah. right, conservative, placating yeah. to whites, why yeah. was there such an issue between him and Harlan? I mean, yeah. not Harlan, uh, Dixon. Dixon. Dixon was very in tune with Booker T. Washington and what was going on at Tuskegee. He made his personal business to be involved in what was going on at Tuskegee, sort of spying on them and what was happening there. And I don't argue that he's wrong. What I'm saying is, is this, Washington wore such a mask yep. that when Thomas Dixon calls him out for what is actually happening at Tuskegee, um, he, what other white, Southern and Northern and, and white philanthropists who are giving money to Tuskegee hardly believe him because the same evidence doesn't produce the same result in terms of interpretation. They are wedded to this idea of who they think Washington is. And then there is the reality of what Washington is and what's happening at Tuskegee, period. Now, yeah. my job as the researcher was to say, when I give this information from what Thomas Dixon is thinking, my job is to qualify it. Is this happening at Tuskegee? What exactly is happening at Tuskegee? Is there any truth in it? Okay, mm -hmm. at all. And there is great truth to it. Okay. Uh, however, if you are full of, um, how would you say, if you're full, I wouldn't even say full of ideology, but if you're full, you're you're caught up in some of the public narrative or the propaganda, then you will not be able to qualify exactly what's being said against what is happening okay and that is also my answer to why a little bit why tuskegee and washington are maligned people yeah. understand that if this is duplicated this is dangerous even thomas dixon who i'm going to quote says that's great you're doing this at tuskegee but you know what take that to liberia take that to africa don't do that here mm. Mm. Okay? Yes. In the end of that article, that is what uh, Thomas Dixon is saying. And this comes from an article called The Dangerous Aspects of the Work at Tuskegee, mm. uh, written by Thomas Dixon. And that is precisely what he ends the article with. Like, hey, send that to Liberia. Liberia is a viable place for you because you will never be, we're not going to allow you to be on equal footing with us. And when you understand who Thomas Dixon was and what he is saying, he's not saying you're doing what you're doing and yeah, you're progressing and um, you won't be on equal footing. He is the person who inspires the second wave of the Klan. He is saying that you can press and replicate what Washington is doing, but we will ultimately murder you because we will not compete with you. Woo. That is what he's saying because, and he's saying, I'm a friend to the Negro because I'm telling you the truth. The regular white folks here are not going to tell you this, but it's still going to happen. Woo. All right? That's, Thomas Dixon that's writes amazing. The Klansman. The Klansman is the uh, the book that Birth of the Nation is based on. Yeah. The film Birth of the Nation rallies the Klan for the second time in this country, uh. just at the turn of the century. That rallying call, if anybody knows what Birth of the Nation is about, it's not any random film. It is a film that encourages white men to come together and engage in mob violence against Black people and kill them ultimately, right? The narrative is that this black man, you know, takes captive some white woman and they all get together, white men rally together and capture him, okay? And so 
Thomas Dixon is sort of he's dog it's a dog whistle, but unfortunately they don't got their minds right and it doesn't work <laughs> uh in that instance uh for Washington. It doesn't work that way, but he's working hard to maintain certain things. So this is the the open on the opening of uh chapter three. And it's important because I heard you, Dr. Uh, Harris, use some of the language too yeah. that is in here. Yes. So Thomas Dixon uh, writes this, and the article is called Booker T. Washington and the Negro, Some Dangerous Aspects of the Work of Tuskegee. And it's written in the Saturday Evening Post, Philadelphia, August 1905, volume 178, for those who want to find it. And there's an interesting story how I even get the article. A real, I get a copy of the original article. So that's a whole nother story. But uh, <laughs> uh, so he says, Mr. Washington is not training Negroes to take their place in any industrial system of the South in which the white man directs or controls him. He is not training his students to be servants and come at the beck and call and at the beck and call of any man. He is training them all to be masters of men, to be independent, to own and operate their own industries, to plant their own fields, buy and sell their own goods, and in every shape and form, destroy the last vestige of dependence on the white man for anything. Woo! Every pupil who passes through Mr. Washington's hands ceases forever to work under a white man. Not only so, but he goes forth trained as an evangelist to preach the doctrine of separation and independence. So Thomas Dixon writes that in the Saturday Evening Post under the title of Booker T. Washington, Some Dangerous Aspects of the Work at Tuskegee. Now, right. is that true or not? I would say, I mean, I, I could say yes on many levels because Tuskegee yeah. is doing exactly what he says. Yeah. Okay? Now, one's interpretation uh, of what's happening in Tuskegee could be anything depending on your worldview and your position in relationship to them. Yeah. But clearly, even author Evans, who I read early on, saying that Tuskegee is certainly not a school, right? In the traditional sense of the word, it is a sustainable community where you know they are being taught to perfect everything that they consume uh, all through education. So yes, that is consistent throughout in terms of if we were to qualify what Tuskegee is, it is very clear. Now, yeah. why is Washington maligned? And, and I could just really quickly address the Du Bois Washington thing, because if we knew this, if we internalize this, we would have already remedied our issue here, there, and everywhere that we are. And I'm talking about African people, Black people. We would have already remedied our condition, whether that is on the continent, because once Washington perfects this Tuskegee model, he does what one would do. He shares it with the African world, the people he loves the most. Absolutely. It's clear. And, I, and let me say this. I'm saying... What I'm saying, it's documented in the book, but Washington says it all. He tells you in the story of the Negro everything that I'm saying for the most part in no uncertain terms. Yep. Why don't we know this? We don't know this because at this pivotal moment in history that we're about to address the Du Bois Washington thing at the turn of the century, Washington is talking about us and our story Du Bois is talking about what we lost as a result of the reversal of re radical reconstruction. So that is the conversation at the day of the day, the the fourteenth and the fifteenth amendments to the Constitution, and how Johnson and that administration rolled the clock back on us and reversed all of the progress that was made in that first twelve years out of enslavement. Okay. And yes, the progress is sharp. Trust me, there's no group of people who know history who are not jealous of that and our capability yeah. to do that. If they know that 12 years in our history after 250 years in enslavement, 
uh, then they know the essence of who we are. And trust me, mm. this is part of the reason why we will never see those same conditions today because they are paying attention to that. We are paying paying for those 12 years and Absolutely. those first 50, first 50 years. We're paying for that. They have promised that that will never happen again. So you are sold this narrative that the civil rights movement is your height of your progress, where yeah. you give up everything that you have to integrate. And the truth of the matter is, is that that isn't the height of our progress. The first 12 or the first 50 years out of enslavement is the height of our progress. We have our own communities. We're sustainable. We are, listen, nobody is more uh, dedicated to edu education than we are. We know that it's going to prepare us to master our own communities, sustain our own communities, and it's going to prepare us to have this citizenship that has been provided for us under the 14th Amendment. Yeah. Uh, so Black we excellence. understand that Tuskegee Black is excellence. literally a the a, a testimony to that. Now, why do I say that? Lewis Adams, who is the conceptual founder of this school, is the embodiment of that. Tuskegee is a buzzing political place during the Reconstruction period, uh, eighteen eighty one. Incumbent. Uh, Senator Foster wants to capture the black vote at Tuskegee. Listen, Kwame Ture writes in Black Power about Tuskegee. There's a reason why. They are politically astute and they are progressive during the Reconstruction period. And so this senator wants to capture the black vote. He contacts Lewis Adams, who is formerly enslaved, survived the, and I always like to say, survived the institution of slavery. And and, and and truth be told, we are the people who defeated the institution of yeah, slavery, we just, okay? Yeah. There's a whole nother story to talk about there as well. We, that was not part of the plan, our freedom at all. We took it, we, okay? took we took it. We took our freedom while they were carrying on, we took it. And, and that was not part of the plan. And so we survived and defeated the institution of slavery. Lewis Adams is a part product of that. He's on the other side during the reconstruction period. Reconstruction ends. They're rolling the clock back on us. And Foster wants to garner the black vote of this progressive black community. He contacts Lewis Adams. Lewis Adams agrees to organize the black vote. And when he does, he organizes it in the favor of Foster. Foster returns and asks him, what does he want? He says something very simple that goes down in history. He says, a school for my people. Mm. Mm. Damn. He does not say, I want a team of oxen. Give me a plot of land. Nothing. He says, a school for my people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so important because it were at that moment of time. Who is more deprived than a person who survives the institution of slavery? Yeah. Where your body is not even your own. Who, not even your own. Who's That's more right. deprived? No one. And he still had a sense of, of oneness with the community at large. My people. My not people. My sister, that not power my sister, in unity. Not my, not unity. my oh, people. And that is how Foster goes back to the state of Alabama, they say, okay, we'll give a $2,000 allotment for the Negro Normal School at Tuskegee, which has no building, which has nothing, $2,000 to pay teachers to come there. Mm. It is housed in an AME church in Tuskegee, one room with nothing at all, no books, no nothing. It is at that time they write, Lewis Adams and others write to Hampton for Booker T. Washington. Yeah. But what's so significant about this? Because I'm not taking anything away from Washington. What he comes is that, and he does something very significant. He comes there at 26 years old with a wife. So somebody put in there Portia. Portia is his first wife. She dies and she's buried there at Tuskegee as well. Then Olivia Davidson also, uh, he marries her and she's buried there. And Margaret Murray Washington was his last wife that survives him. Uh, but the point is, is that 
uh, they come there and they begin to build the institution. Washington is raising money for the school and maintaining the school. He never calls the school, calls himself the president. He always calls himself the principal. Yeah. But in 18, in 1893, Booker T. Washington does something that is very unique to him. He tells the state of Alabama, keep your money. Mm. It makes the institution independent. Mm. I saw in the comments. I'm glad I'm reading the comments because somebody mentioned Ford. What what does he do? He realizes that he can make more money going on the road for with Ford and raising for money for Tuskegee in that way. And so he tells the state of Alabama, keep your two thousand dollars. He establishes the new charter that makes the institution independent and Ooh. gives it to the community, establishes a board, okay? This is very uniquely Washington, yeah. okay? And this is why today, Tuskegee, this is one of the things that still exists. Tuskegee has a unique classification It to this day. It's quasi-private. It is a private institution, but state-affiliated when it needs to be. Mm. Mm. It is belongs to the people. And that was the most important thing Washington would do. He would take the institution back from the state of uh, Alabama in terms of its dependence on their $2,000. And we know that he raises much more than that. I can document that in uh, 1904, he is writing to some individuals involved in giving money to Tuskegee. He says to them in passing, I want to speak to this person because Tuskegee's endowment, he's very educated on this stuff. Tuskegee endowment is $1.4 million, 1904. But guess what he says? It's $1.4 million. It should be $4 million. Mm. (laughs) And he's about to get that money. And I'm sure he does. Yeah. That being said, so right, so the thinking you're born a slave, you're talking about our endowment. Some of these institutions that are existing at the same time don't even have an endowment no to question. speak of at that moment exactly. in time. Exactly. This is an institution that he makes independent from the state, and he has the might and the foresight to raise money to that level. And even when he's raising more than most, right, an endowment right? That the, the institution is going to collect interest from. Are you serious? He's saying our endowment, that's not the money that's just sustaining us. We need our endowment to be $4 million. Okay? In 1904, at the turn of the century. So that's my point is, is that there's an intentional, if we were, if we were to implement the economic program that Washington set um out for us we would all we would not have any of the issues that we have today here not here and not on the african continent not anywhere we are okay that is why you have been this maligning of washington in the academy in larger society and collectively in, in, in the historical narrative in, in terms of American history. That is why. So you cannot invoke or implement the models that you wouldn't dare. You will simply be ignorant to them, okay? So there, no offense, I'm not taking anything away from Du Bois. Du Bois is radical in his own right, but he serves a very different purpose. And I think we should shy away from comparing them because I'm they're two they're two completely different people. They're two different generations. Of I will people. never compare the two again. Right. They're two different two generations of people. Washington born in enslavement. Du Bois born right out of right after the Civil War, 1868. Yeah. Okay. So he knows nothing of the institution of slavery. Um and not in a real way, not in an experienced way. Lived right? Experience. right, lived experience. He does not have that. On the other hand, Washington recalls when he is emancipated. Yep. Okay, which, by the way, folks should um, be abreast of the fact that this year, right here, right now, top of the year, 
this is the um, 160th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, in 1863 uh, that Lincoln writes. Uh, and just so you know, Lincoln did not want to do that. He didn't it want is it. Frederick Douglass, who has a connection to Washington. That's one of the things I'm currently researching, the relationship between uh, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, because there is. And, and honestly, thank you, um, all my scholars who came before me, because you give me so much to do. You understand? I like go all the way back to the primary source and the personal paper. So that's one of the things I'm reading right now. This conversation between um, uh, Du Bois, I mean, not Du Bois, uh, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, okay, who a real lay Tuskegee historian has tipped me off that there is a very interesting relationship there. That well, not, has- not, not just interesting, so much of their relationship, Frederick Douglass's son marries Booker T. Washington's daughter. So okay. after the first generation, mm-hmm. you actually have the Douglas side of the family and the Washington side of the family, and their tree follows as such. So their family tree is combined, Washington and Douglas. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the other thing, too. So, like, people don't really, um, we are so blessed that I, we can go back to these individuals words our ancestors words why we don't do that or and don't get me wrong it's tedious work but i'm surprised that you know this book that i wrote it could have been i'm never going to try to say that i did something that somebody before me couldn't have done um someone could have done it before me was it painful to do yes because we're talking about a lot of history every volume is about three to five hundred pages you have to get, you have to go back to context, who's who. It's a lot of tedious work. Um, and it's work that does take courage. Trust me, there are people on here. There's no shortage of people who like, you know, like send me a little hate just for saying Washington is a Pan-Africanist, okay? <laughs> and like, yeah. trust me, I go make whole posts and say a whole bunch of stuff about it. But it, I, I have no problem with it because I understand I don't get emotionally involved in that kind of stuff because what I'm documenting is factual. It's coming straight from the source. So there's no question about it, right? Like it's like the truth. Uh, truth crushed to the ground still rises. So it's it's no problem. It's there. It's documented, written in black and white. But that being said, um, uh, really quickly, uh, Frederick Douglass is the person who gets in Lincoln's ear. Uh, and and I'm not saying he was friends with him, but he had Lincoln's ear and he gets in his ear and he says, you're either a coward or a fool not to let the half a million African, and he doesn't say African, but black people fight for their freedom. And that's the main reason why uh, we end up in the Civil War. At the same time, we're forcing our way into it and all of that, meaning that... Um, you have the contraband act because we take matters into our own hand and 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 run from plantations to um, union camps in the south with no protection, all on our own volition, just that thirst to be free. So nobody should listen. We have we only have ourselves to praise, worship, all of that. Okay, the mightiest ancestors on the earth. Period. Hands down. Period. Uh, a fact. So. Du Bois, Washington, I know I'm kind of like, I'm just trying to wrap it this little bit up. Du Bois and Washington, it's all propaganda, the the relationship. Ooh, the all pro- it's all propaganda. It's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, this is a documented fact. I'm yeah. not saying they didn't have a uh, issue. I'm or saying I, the issue, or ideological, right, ideological right. differences. It's yeah. not, it's right. So they, I'm not saying they didn't have an issue. It's not what's put out in the public realm. And now I would say that Du Bois is probably more responsible than that than Washington. Washington said nothing in comparison to Du Bois writing something and giving this impression in 1903 that they did have a com- conflict, okay? He's intentionally doing that because like most of us, it's like 
any of us having a problem with someone we're close with. We're not going to tell the public exactly the, the details of it. So he writes in Souls of Black Folks that there is a programmatic difference. And, but later on, he writes in his own words, in my personal relations with Booker T. Washington, he says that we did not have a programmatic difference. And that's part of the reason why in my book, I give you the first two letters that Du Bois writes to Washington. His connection to Margaret Murray Washington, they both went to Fisk. And um, and that's his relationship to Washington. That's how he Ooh. contacts him uh, through his wife. And and then also too, he is always planning to teach at Tuskegee. That's the purpose of sharing the second letter that Du Bois writes because he talks about after leaving the University of Pennsylvania for the one year, coming to Tuskegee and putting the study of the Negro on a more scientific level and expanding it, perhaps having a center where they can engage in the scientific study. But he ends it with saying that he is eager to make his contribution to what? Tuskegee. Period. Okay. Yes. That being said, no man who thinks that this is only a vocational industrial school is saying that when he is a social scientist. He knows that teaching is going on there. He knows that history is part of the curriculum. He is aware of all of that. He spends the summers at Tuskegee, even in the summer of 1903, we can find him on the campus of Tuskegee with Booker T. Washington at his house, Woo! okay? And that is the real issue between them. He then goes on to, and 1903 is significant because it's the same year that the, um, the Souls of Black Folks comes out. But also in 1903, there's the Boston riots. And Du Bois goes on to Boston, Du Bois goes to Boston and he spends some time with Monroe Trotter. Trotter is a public and a real critic of Washington. Yep. Okay. There, now that rift is real. Uh, Trotter has the Guardian. He frequently criticizes Washington in it. Du Bois goes there after spending the summer in Tuskegee in Washington's house with his family, eating their food, sleeping in their bed <laughs> in a safe space, okay? Uh, and he coalesces with Trotter. He, he tells Trotter he's impressed by how he handled as leadership in Boston, the Boston riots. Washington sees this later on and he's offended. You stay with me, my family, you coalesce with us, and then you go and you coalesce with my arch enemy. And, and yes, Trotter is a more formidable enemy, perhaps because Washington is aware that Trotter is the only um, paper that he does not control and actively uses it as such to criticize him, okay? So every other um, outlet of the Black press is significant Washington has significant control of period hands down there's no question about that okay and he he consistently uses it and uses it well that being said um Du Bois uh is disenchanted with Washington quietly for the most part because of Washington's power particularly his use and occasional abuse as he states it of the Tuskegee machine. It is truly a generational issue there because he knows that Washington is strong enough, powerful enough, connected enough um, to silence anyone that he wants to silence, okay? And, 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 and so the unspoken is the obvious, which is that, of course, Du Bois witnessing this understands that Washington could perhaps silence him if he wanted to. Yeah. Obviously, that occurs to him. And so he has this issue, you know, quietly. He's he's more like a sort of seething young man, but it's never a full out confrontation. Washington over and again seems to be a little oblivious of the level to which Du Bois yes. um, may have an issue with him. He, he, he likens it to a man who was always opposing him. And when 
what he opposed disappeared, the man had no platform mm. or nothing to speak about because his whole platform was criticizing this, you know, this particular individual. He, he compares Du Bois to that. And he is not seething. He has no angst. He gets over this issue of Du Bois aligning himself with Monroe Trotter. Okay, because at the end of his life in 1915 with the African exclusion measure, you see uh, someone write Washington and say, this is a great thing. We have this wonderful alliance all against this uh, racist measure. All of you guys can go arm in arm against this measure. But this is the significant thing and the irony of it all. And this is what I was telling Dr. Harris last night. The very thing that Du Bois had an issue with Washington about, which was the Tuskegee machine and, and the power that it had, was the very vehicle that Washington uses to defeat the African exclusion measure. Trotter, Washington, Du Bois, and others are opposed to it. Washington airs out this piece of legislation that's coming, that came out of the Senate and is about to go before the House of Representatives. He puts it in the black press to expose it. Meanwhile, he's also working behind the scenes. But he's working behind the scenes with what? The Tuskegee machine. This is, mm. forgive me, but this is what separates the men from the boys in this instance. Ooh. That has yeah. palatable and significant power to change US legislation forever. Not for five years, not for 10 years, Anybody who came into this country after 1915, it is identifiably Black and obviously or culturally African, would not have been allowed in this country, period. Damn. Okay? So we get no Malcolm because his mom is from the Caribbean. Uh, we get no Nkrumah who comes here and gets educated and goes back and liberates Ghana and is, is le leadership. We yeah. get no Barack Obama, for those of you who are on that uh, bandwagon. No, no Marcus Garvey. It's his father, right. You get no Marcus Garvey the very next year. First of all, Marcus Garvey is not even, doesn't have a destination because his destination was Tuskegee. That is the first place he comes to in the United States. But Washington provides and makes it possible because they are looking to lock the Marcus Garveys out. Jamaica is named specifically in the debate on the floor of the house, period. Like Jamaicans are coming here who are wholly and partly African in, in culture and black in race, okay? Mm -hmm. They're the hands down, they're like no Jamaicans. It is directed at the African population coming specifically from the Caribbean, Central and South America because they are the ones who labored on the Panama Canal. And when they finish laboring, the U.S. government, namely a man, uh, a senator out of Missouri named uh, Reed, Senator Reed, James Reed, wanted to make it clear that once this job is done, although you all got used to U.S. wages, thank you for your labor, no, on the question of immigration. Mm. You cannot come here. And so he proposes and enters this one line amendment into the larger immigration bill that says to exclude anyone of the black or African race. And it passes with flying colors. And they attach a little caveat to it. The idea was to exclude anyone of the black or African race from the US forever and put them in the same category as undesirables or criminals. Mm attempting to enter the country. So this is one of the first times you see in U.S. legislation where you see the criminalization of blackness in African culture. Mm. Okay, documented. And it is due to go to the House of the Representatives in January of 1915, between the first and the seventh. And just to show you the power of Washington's Tuskegee machine, they are able to defeat that measure in one week. If that were to happen now, we don't have that same kind of power. With yep. all the black faces in this neo-colonial phase that we are in in America, we got a lot of black faces, but black presence does not mean black progress. We've got to qualify who they serve, right? Black faces. Time and again, he never fails to bring it home. I like what you said before, uh, Dr. Harris, because 
See, I always say, and people don't get it, Washington never lost his way home. He didn't right. take his power back to anywhere else but Tuskegee. And when he exports it, he's exporting it to Africa. Okay? We right now, we don't get it. We think that our presence in certain spaces means us progressing. And we do absolutely nothing for our own community or people. Matter of fact, we understand that the condition of our presence in those places means that you better not, you better not do anything for them. So it's just our leadership tends to be, and I don't even want to call them leadership, our figureheads that are in those visible spaces it's a that is the condition through which they are there they understand that so they are usually the antithesis to leadership for us yeah they they will in measurable ways work against us yeah okay because they understand the condition of their presence in the spaces that they are and so we you know we've got some great confusion but that being said so Washington in that final moments of his life, yes, Du Bois, Washington are a lie, but Washington, um, you know, he he significantly displays the fact that he can wield power in the most significant way and changes U.S. legislation. If anybody's questioning about who he is, he is opposing the U.S. government on behalf of not African people inside of the U.S., but African people outside. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's up. Yes. And yeah. he knows they're going to benefit. Okay? Yeah. And he's okay with that. That's yeah. why we can call him a pan Africanist. Right. And he's not going to let go of those steady stream of students coming from the African continent to Tuskegee. Yes, to be educated. Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> so you know what? Um Listen, um, guys, I, I was looking, I was like, wow, we've been on for three hours. Oh, yeah. I and know. I, I was I was like, yesterday, I said, like, we're just going to be like an hour and a half. You know, I'm sure I was like, I know it's a lot, you know, so I appreciate you guys staying, staying here. Um, I just want to thank you because along like with myself, like learning so much and um, I can't wait to have a conversation with the kids tomorrow about this. Um, and I'm seeing everyone else, you know, that's in the chat chiming in some people knew stuff so I was like I didn't know that and I I just so appreciate you guys coming on and bringing your scholarship the whole time when you're talking I'm like this is black excellence like both <laughs> of you are examples of black excellence Thank talking you. about black excellence like this was um wow I had to make sure I order your book I was like I was like let me I want to sign autograph copy I'm okay. just because there's a lot of people who's buying the book um, in, in the chat. So we just want some little sign. Oh, yeah, that. please. I have 50 oh. on, of my own that I'm going to get rid of uh, this month. There it is. There it is. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Harris, I, it was a treat having you on here. I cannot wait to see you. I was, you know what? Look, today we started our official countdown. Okay. It, today was 30. It's 30, it's 30 days until your birthday and um, 30 days until the black um black excellence day and when you guys were talking i was like you know what let me just share this one you know i was i was sharing our, our newest one i was like let me just go back to a little old school one we were sharing in honor of booker t washington um okay. oh that's, that's yeah. douglas yeah yeah so um in 30 days family we will be um hosting the uh, happy the first happy black day of excellence uh with right here dr ken harris he will be hosting with uh, along with uh, Dr. Susan Tata, Riza Islam, Dr. Georgina Falu, Professor James Small, Infudishi Juhuti Miss, and Kaba Kamene. Uh, we will have performances by Brand Nubian, Jamar Milton, and Lyrical Faith. Now, you know, if that wasn't enough, and we have vendors um, that will be in the space, but um, and we'll have m- plenty of time to, you know, to network to um, just be loving on each other because it's a day of loving on each other, right? Loving ourselves and loving on each other. We will also um, show uh, extended clips of Hoppy, the role of economics in the the development of of civilization. If you guys don't know, we actually have a whole documentary, okay? Um, Two hours and 12 minutes that you can go, you know, where you get your tickets at, you can also get a copy of Hoppy, hoppyfilm.com. So we're going to show extended clip of our film and then we will have Amadeus Christ. He will be in the house. OK, um, showing his film, an extended clip of Out of the Darkness, 
Heavy is the Crown Volume 1. Wow. And yes, and a couple of, you know, of our presenters are in both films. Infudishi Juhuti Miss, Professor James Small, Kaba, like they're in both films. So this is going to be a um, just a, a beautiful night, I mean, a beautiful day of Black excellence. And I hope that we can take what we, like the spirit of, of Booker T. Washington, we need to bring it. And we need to, it needs to manifest inside of us. Independence through industry. <laughs> yes. I like that. There it is, family. So listen, go to happyfilm.com, get your tickets. Um, like I said, I will see you, Dr. Harris, um, in in 30, officially 30 days. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, if you want, I mean, listen, I, you know. Don't remind me, 30 days. That's my birthday. I know. I was like, yeah, birthdays is kind of, you know, like sometimes I like to be in a hot space for my birthday. You know, uh-huh. New York is a little chilly. You know, but if you could come through, that everyone would be nice. You know, we'd be nice. Well, we'd be- wherever I'm going, I think I already know, but I'm I'll fly out from New York. <laughs> All right, there it is. There it is. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm gonna put you guys um back. I'm gonna close um close off and just hang out just for two two more little minutes, okay, guys? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is so. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, so family, listen. Oh my, we learned so much about Booker T. Washington. We can't. We have to get this book. We have to explore more. We gotta get the character book that Dr. Harris showed showed us. I'm gonna get the name of it so that I can um, make sure it is on our um, social media platforms tomorrow, so everybody you knows uh, you know knows about these books. Family, thank you, thank you, thank you for the Cash App love. Um, if you bought stars, thank you. Thank you for the super chats. You guys don't understand, you know, um, the money that you give us. We are trying to, like, when t- I love it. When Dr. Wright was ro- rolling her finger around many times, okay, for how, how long the money stayed, you know, within that Tuskegee uh, institution. That's what we're trying to create right here at Happy World, right? So we just, you know, we really appreciate whatever you, um, you know, gen- generously give us uh, because we definitely keep it in the family. Um, remember, just go to happyfilm.com, um, get your tickets for Black, uh, for black Excellence. It's going to be a, a very, very good evening, um, a good day. And also, I just want to give a shout out to all the young people that was in the... Um, you know, in the chat. I saw you guys asking questions. I saw you hotepping us. Okay, we're going to have a conversation about what hotep means, but I appreciate the love um, from you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, other than that, I'm going to close with my saying that I stole from Professor Small, which is peace and blessings. know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority honestly who defines the meaning of god also defines the relationship between economy and god african americans spent 1.3 trillion dollars last year making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community